Yeah, first of all, a uh, warm welcome to you all to this conference about the evidence basis for treatment with or without the use of medicine. Uh, we filled this room and we had to also rent another room, Amalia Scrum, in the second floor, and we are video conferencing up to this room. So welcome to everyone up in Amalia Scrum. We are also streaming this live out on the internet. So hello to everybody that's watching us uh, out there in cyberspace. <laughs> My name is uh, Einar Plyn. I'm the leader of uh, Stiftelsen Humania. That is arranging this conference together with Fellesaktionen for medicinfrie behandlingsplasser. Fellesaktionen, as you know, is a collaboration of five user organizations within the field of mental health care. Stiftelsen Humania is a non-profit organization or a ideal allmennyttig stiftelse, as we say in Norwegian. Just a few words before I yield the floor to Halvor Kjølstad, which is going to lead us through tonight's program. There will be two short breaks. We are serving some coffee, tea and uh, ice water uh, down here. Um, we have a tight schedule, so it's important that after you have you know, stretched your legs and had something to drink, that you find your seat again so we can continue uh, within the time we have for disposal. Finally, before I give the words to Halvor, I just want to announce the next concert, uh, conference, which will be alternative to psychiatric disease model and diagnosis for understanding suicide. And we have been so lucky to get the keynote speaker, Davis Jobs, uh, which is one of the leading scholars within the field of uh, sociology. And this is uh, an arrangement uh, together with Leve, Westerviken Helseforetak and Høyskolen i Oslo og Akershus. It's now my pleasure to introduce Halvor Kjølstad, who will share tonight's event. Halvor is a psychologist and a member of Stiftels Humania's board. Halvor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Einar, and uh, good evening, everybody. As Einar said, we have a tight schedule this evening, so I'll just um, start introducing our first speaker. And our first speaker is Håkon Rian Ueland, who is rep representing Fellesaktionen, and he is also the leader of We Shall Overcome. And in his daily life, he works with minor single asylum seekers in the rocket star. So, welcome, it's yours. Yes. Gotta find my, uh, anybody hear me? Can you hear me? It's good. Uh, gotta find my presentation first. It's not there. Here, I think. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, very pleased to be able to talk to such a lot of nice people. Uh, this is... Uh, why is nothing there? Um, mm, there. Uh, you heard all that already. I'm going to talk first about the process from... The, the health minister first asked for uh, 
medicine-free, drug-free treatment to uh, be implemented in the health regions of Norway. He asked twice, nicely, uh, that didn't work. So then he told them, start planning and uh, you should be ready by 1st of June 2016. Uh, and they did start planning, and they did start implementing, and nobody was finished by 1st of June 2016. Um, they asked for help from some of the members' organizations, the, the user organizations in Norway. And uh, they did, some did a very good job. Uh, up in Tromsø, they did a very good job, and they were very solid. And others did a... Mm -mm. The important thing was, should patients have the possibility to choose mental health care without medication? We have Jan Uverisberg here, who says no, there shouldn't, because the evidence for this being a good treatment isn't strong enough. He thinks it's a bad idea. I would like to lift the voice of somebody who disagrees, a user. Her name is Elina and she wrote a blog post six days ago about medication-free alternatives. Uh, her blog address is there. I suggest you take a look at it. Perhaps she's sitting next to you. I know she asked for, I asked for her permission to, to use her post in my presentation, and she said yes. Uh, she said she was, wanted to ask for permission to, to leave the hospital. She's in a locked mental ward and her, she didn't have a choice going in there, so she wasn't sure if she could get out. She's 25 years old. I put up the, the Norwegian post here and I'll read the English, so those of you who wish can stick with the Norwegian. What she writes is, I've lost count of how many times I've been given drugs against my, own, my will. I wouldn't, wouldn't wish this for anybody. It has made me lose valuable time of my youth, time I can never regain. I remember thinking that the nurses gave me and other patients drugs to make their job easier. Naturally, it's much more comfortable to work with a gang of zombies than to play cat and mouse all the time. But the thought scared me. Today I know it isn't so. I choose to believe in the good in people. I believe that the nurses had the wish to help, not drug me to remove my personality. That was what I felt happened. I said so, but I wasn't hurt. It hurt. More than all, the pain of the needles. It hurts even to think about it. Even today, I would rather be psychotic than to use antipsychotics. I've heard others say the same, and there must be a reason for this. Unfortunately, we are many who have been forcefully drugged and been traumatized by this. I'm afraid that experiences such as this can lead people to losing their trust in the people who are actually there to help. I am no way a med I am no way an expert in medicine. I'm not a doctor. I'm only a human being. A human being who knows a whole lot about the disadvantages of forced drugging. I stand firm by the conviction that patients should have the liberty to choose not to take drugs as long as it's defendable. Naturally, medicines may be of help to some people, but for people who are as strongly opposed to them as I am, alternative solutions should be found, because help can be found that doesn't feature psychotropic drugs. Ben Teuye recently said something about people being different and experiencing treatment in different ways. With medication-free alternatives, patients are taken seriously. Patients are experts in their own health. It makes me happy to hear that other people feel the same. We have to take care of and have our, our autonomy respected. There are so many patients in psychiatric health care who don't want to be treated with drugs. They must be listened to and taken seriously. There are many other ways to give necessary care and treatment. Talking therapy, cognitive therapy, are just a couple of examples. It's time to use some creativity. If one decides to treat patients with psychotropic agents without their consent, Several criteria must be fulfilled. These people must have, first of all, a serious mental health issue. Alone, this is not enough. They must pose a danger to their own or other people's lives, or it must be evident that the medication will lessen the chance of the illness becoming worse. I've not been in danger for myself or others. I've been psychotic and I've been scared. Very scared. Fear should not be medicated away. 
Being scared while being involuntarily committed to a closed psychiatric ward is, in my point of view, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Having said all this, I do not oppose to all medication. I think they can help many. I use some drugs today, and they work well for me. I don't like it, but I understand it's for the best. What I'm concerned with is that everybody should be given a real choice. You should be allowed to select not to take drugs if you don't want to, and to choose some other treatment in which you believe. I believe that with people, people should be respected as human beings and not just seen as another psychotic case. Is that possible? Yes, I definitely think so. If you don't try that, it will be a major mistake. I think that she puts forward in words much better my point. I think this is a very strong way of saying we need alternatives. It's not good enough just to throw some Cyprexa or whatever antipsychotic medicine or antidepressants or whatever. It's not good enough. You have to talk with people. You have to find out what is your wish, what is your dream, what is your history. Don't ask them what's wrong, what's wrong with you. Ask what happened with you. That's important. Then you can touch people and you can help them find a better life. Thank you. Thank you, Håkon Rian Ueland. You have really set the scene for, a, for an active discussion tonight, I think. Uh, and I now have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Jan Ivar Rusberg, who is a psychiatrist and a professor at the University of Oslo. And you have been working for many years. Uh, you have been interested in research concerning psychosocial interventions for patients with severe mental disorders. And you are also teaching psychiatry for medicine students here at the University of Oslo. And uh, your theme is psychiatric wards without medication. Why is it a bad idea? So, welcome. Oh, yeah, you have to. <laughs> Thank you for being invited. I was invited by uh, Giselle Wilkom for three years ago, I think, with uh, Bob, and uh, we just have a, had a discussion then. Yeah. Then, uh, yes. Then uh, there was no doctors in the audience. I was mistaken. There was one, but he almost didn't dare to say that he was a doctor. So he was a backbencher who said, yes, I'm a doctor. I think they're more mixed now. What I'm going to talk about is psychiatric wards without medication, why I think it is a bad idea. This is my main text today. The history of psychology, psychiatry, is full of treatment approaches for patients with psychosis, which have had enthusiastic and engaged followers but that after a while have been shown to be ineffective or even harmful. Today, we should expect that new methods for treatment are thoroughly examined and tested before they are recommended, so we don't repeat the mistakes in the past. Since 1997, I have researched psychosocial intervention for, for uh, uh, patients with uh, severe mental disorders. Mostly milieu therapy, early intervention, family work, and psychotherapy. Much of the stuff that's are going to be implemented in the medication-free boards. I'm trained in psychodynamic psychotherapy, and I'm supervisor in cognitive therapy. And I have no, no research, including medications, and no collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry. But almost today, I have no, no book I want to sell and I have no psycholo psychological therapy or psychotherapy I want you to use. This debate has been largely on anecdotes, so I also want to tell you anecdotes. I did a CBT project for a couple of years ago. This is one of my patients. He was, I have anonymized him. He was admitted to acute ward. He had several voices in his head. He was living in a Truman world, 
whenever he walked on the train, everybody could read his mind. Everyone. He was anxious, depressed. They started at the acute ward with Abilify, Ariprepasol, no effect. A couple of months, they started with Olanzapine, Zyprexa, he gained weight, no effect. Lastly, when he came to me, he was on Seroquel, Quetiapine, and I started the cognitive behavior therapy. I introduced him to the principles, ABC, case formulation, and try to build an alliance. And it was difficult. But soon you see, after week six, he improved markedly. This is his rating of how well he has been during the last week. So we had tried three antipsychotics, and he was starting cognitive psychotherapy. What do you think about it? Excellent psychotherapy, he's improving a lot. I am a good psychotherapist, or? Yeah, maybe, I think I'm a very good. So, there's no problem, just that I didn't tell you the whole story. Something happened there. He started with clozapine. Is this still me, who is a good therapist now, or is it the medication? This is the fourth medication he's using. I met him for a couple of months ago and start talking to him. He's now in full work and asked him if he would choose medication-free words when he gained weight during the olanzapine. He said he would be in doubt. I am very doubtful and critical if he have chosen that. I could tell you several such stories. The joint action or Felix action, I think we can use the Felix action here for medication free treatment. Who are they? Mental Helse, Vitorn, Landsforening for Pauren, Insyx Helse, Aurora, and We Shall Overcome. Who are they? Three of them are real, purely anti psychiatric organizations. Aurora, We Shall Overcome, and Vitorn. I don't think they want psychiatrists, I don't even think they want psychologists. Have they something in common? No, I don't think so. Except for one thing, they don't want antipsychotics. That's the only thing I have found out. What do they want? They want psychiatric ward without medication, the possibility to choose treatment they sell will live in and want, no forced medication, a safe place to be, a bed to sleep in, regular meals, people to talk with, and develop a culture of treatment methods without medication. We can go through these points after. What is medication-free treatment? Who is going to be treated in psychiatric wards without medication? Can someone please tell me that soon? Is it bipolar disorder? Is it personality disorders? Is it affective disorders? Is it first episode psychosis? Is it those who don't have effect of antipsychotic? Is it those who have been violated by psychiatric treatment, who is it So are going to be treated? I think we should have decided that before we start, not afterward. We, we usually do that when we plan the services. We start, plan who is this treatment for? What kind of treatment intervention should the ward include? The patients is going to choose whatever they want. As long as it includes no chemicals or surgery, the patient is going to have the possibilities to try the treatment intervention they themselves believe in. The patient must have the abilities to choose the treatment intervention they believe in. A shaman could have an important role. If you believe in healing, you should receive it without discussion. So my definition of medication or drug-free boards is a psychiatric ward for everyone, where the patients should receive everything they want. Hello, we have come far further today. Has the Felix Axelsson succeeded? Could I have some water? Could you give me that? Thank you. What has they achieved so far? Helsemit. They start now with a ward for patients with depression and anxiety. What 
that was, was, was that the kind of patience Felix Action would improve the treatment? No. In the same time in Helse Mitt, they are turning down ACT team, who has several studies have shown that is very effective. Helse West is just doing whatever they are doing and always have doing. They are no, but they are no re re registering the, the patients with psychosis who don't got, get uh, medication. Helse Nord, I will come back to. And Helse Sørøst has several different uh, implementations. User involvement. Shared decision making is important and should be obvious in mental health care. I want more power to the patients and more and stronger user involvement, but not at the expense of what promotes mental health. User involvement is essential, especially in designing optimal health services. But, and this is a big but, shared decision making. We have to inform patients with mental health problems in an objective way about all effective treatments and side effects. We have to clearly describe what is the positive effects and what is the negative effects. I think the patient should have the ability to choose non-documented treatment if they want, even harmful. But that is not the official health care system should pay. Is this? I asked the president of the Norwegian Psychological Association, how would you inform a patient with a first episode psychosis about evidence-based treatment? This is a first episode psychosis. He said, I would inform him her about the serious side effects of medication and the good effects of therapy and let the patient choose. Is that evidence-based? Is it? No. If the president of the Norwegian Psychological Association can say that, who, what will the patients outside meet? I don't know. Do we really need antipsychiatric iron in the health system? Thanks, you, but no. I wrote in Aftenposten, 14 Juni, uh, for, <laughs> Juni. <laughs> Uh, it is not correct, as stated by our health minister, that there are well-documented treatment approaches without the use of medication for patients with psychosis. The head of the uh, INCITA, Hurdal Recovery Center, was quite annoyed when he was interviewed and confronted with that, uh, that facts for me and said, this is not about being for or against medication. The point is how we use the medication. The discussion is about correct use of medication. Hello. Are we going to have some words with correct use of medication and some words with incorrect use of medication? No, we are going to have correct use of medication all over mental health system. Optimal treatment of psychosis is mostly of, of, is often both medication and psychosocial interventions. And think more psychosocial intervention, more psychotherapy, more family work, more, more, more of psychosocial in intervention. And then the patient could also be able to functioning with lower doses of antipsychotics. It should never be either or. The patients are not served by choosing side, and we don't need special unit where the purpose is not to give a well-documented treatment. Psychiatric wards without medication are not evidence-based. No guidelines, nationally or internationally, describe medication-free treatment. Resources to plan and organize medication-free wards weakens other treatment interventions. We have to prioritize in the health system. To prevent all medication, wrong medication, and un un unnecessary use of coercion are an obvious task for the ordinary mental health system. And it undermines guidelines and scientifically founded treatment. Everyone said that it's many people who want medication free wards. How many wants it? That's also something we should have described before we start this project. 
How, what, what, what is many? Our health minister said that many wants medication free boards. How many? I have asked one year now. Nobody except one have given me an answer. And that's the leader of the user organization at Oslo University Hospital. And she said less than 2% of the patients. That's the only, I don't know, but come up with a number and we can see. Why do we need guidelines? The national guidelines are rooted in patients' experiences, research, and work together to make the best possible treatment for patients with psychosis. There are many good arguments to treat and understand mental health from different models. We have social learning models, we have biomedical models, we have cognitive models, we have psychodynamic models. Therapists have a tendency to prefer one of these models, and they only use that model. We need guidelines so the patient gets optimal treatment, the best possible treatment, not one of them. They are based on well-documented evidence base and benefit-risk evaluation. They are in compliance with latest research. They are in compliance with the English and the Australian guidelines. Emphasizes individual tailored use of medication. Emphasizes informed choice and shared decision makings. Low doses and continuously evaluation of treatment needs. Medication free treatment in Helsing Nord. They are going to offer family and network approaches, physiotherapy, psychoeducation, individual placement and support, different psychotherapeutic approaches, skills training, milieu therapy, acupuncture, physical activity, music therapy, animal assisted treatment, and expressive therapy. A lot. There are no study of one single one of these treatment approaches without medication. It's interesting, acupuncture. In September, three acupuncture from the Norwegian Classical Acupuncture Association wrote in Aftenposten, we acupuncturists can treat mild mental disorder, but we let the psychiatrist and psychologist treat the severe mental disorders. So Helsingor is now offering an offer who is more alternative than the alternative medicine themselves. And that's thoughtful, I think. Which of these treatment interventions do we know most about? And that, that's the three th things I have done much research on. Milieu therapy, psychotherapy, and family work. Let's take a closer look at them. Inpatients should be met in a normalizing way, like we meet other people. The main aim is to create a friendly atmosphere where it is possible to discuss your problems and participate in meaningful daily activities. Where is that qu quote from, do you think? It's Felis Aksjonen? No, it's not. This is 200 years old and was the start of moral treatment for 200 years ago. And we have now 200 years of experience for the fact that medication-free wards are not enough for treating psychosis. Therapeutic communities. Moral treatment was in many ways the precursor of therapeutic communities. And many have said that, yes, we are going back to therapeutic communities. They use extensive, they have extensive use of groups, non higher I can't say that again. Hierarchical organization focused on social interaction between the participants. The ward was a social laboratorium for self-development and understanding. Are we going to go back there? No, we are not. The therapeutic community approach is no longer recommended as its lack of structure and high emotional climate. It's contraindicated for patients with psychosis. I examined 54 Norwegian wards and found that patients with psychosis are less satisfied with their stay if they are lack structure and they are high on emotional climate. They shouldn't have that. Okay, what about milieu therapy based on a psychodynamic approach? That has also been suggested. A psychodynamic approach in the milieu is important. Anything else would be an assault. 
A psychosis is such a strong experience that to approach patients with a cognitive therapeutic or behavior therapeutic intervention is abuse or begrep. Is it? We have a long tradition for psychodynamic milieu therapy. Cessna Lodge is an example. Tom McLashen worked there for almost 20 years. They examined the results and found that they, patients with psychosis didn't get better. And they talked about the patients. They did many things. An interesting paper is about a treatment who lasted 18 years with a psychodynamic psychotherapy approach. Four days a week for 18 years, three different therapeut therapeutics. But no evidence. Since psychodynamic treatment has not been demonstrated to be effective and more effective treatments are available, we propose a moratorium on the use of psychodynamic treatments for schizophrenia. Indeed, if a drug had the efficacy profile of psychoanalysis, it would surely not be prescribed and no one would have the slightest qualm about relegating it to the dustbin of history. I think that's dramatic. But could that happen now with the medication free board? We start boards just with so psychosocial intervention. The, therapeutic, the therapist will see that it not works so good anymore, and we throw it out with the water. They did that with the psychodynamic therapy, I think. Are we repeating the same? Maybe. Need adaptive treatment and open dialogue started about 1960. It's approximately 60 years ago. Why are they still not included in national guidelines? In 2003, Ingrid Melle, Teko Larsen and Svein Fries summarized the finding. They reviewed every publication from Cyclas group and found no adequate reason for his allegation post on. In his publication, we found mostly detailed description of the meaning of the open dialogue concept and single case description. A lot of what is described is not at all justified. If we are going to recommend this intervention, we need a much more adequately performed study with much better quality than what we have found. And then we go 10 years to 2012. Then it came a review published in a journal I don't know, I never heard about. It summarizes all the open dialogue and need adaptive treatment approaches and say that it could have similar or even slightly better effect on treatment as usual. Helse Noor asked for an opinion about that review and that was published in January. What does review say? We attach no credence to this conclusion. That's pretty strong words. This was due to both weakness in the review itself and even obvious weaknesses in the studies included in this review. The very, very rare that they use adjectives to describe findings in research, but here they use obvious. This is qu quite dramatic, I think. What about treatment milieu with an emphasis on psychosis as a crisis and as a possibility for growth and self-understanding? We have at least three models, Sete model in Sweden, Kingsley Hall in London, Soteria House in America and in Switzerland. No studies of the Nordic models. The others, similar results as ordinary treatment and very poor methodology. Thus, there is no evidence of a positive effect of drug-free hospital boards. Or, get to say, there is randomized controlled psychotherapy studies that have shown effect for patients with schizophrenia. And he's right. There is one single study for outpatient. He, he, Tony Morrison, included 74 patients with schizophrenia spectre disorder who refused to take medications. And this is the finding. And this is an interesting study. 
He found a moderate effect sizes on the pan's positive symptoms, but there were several limitations in this study. First of all, one third almost needed medication. Acute psychosis was not included. This was not inpatient, this was old patient. The treatment as usual group, the control group, was younger, male, and more symptomatic at baseline. But a lot of dropouts. The blinding was not normal. And the researchers' allegiance. And the author themselves concludes a larger definitive trial is needed. All this point is very important. Tony Morrison is a quite eager CBT fan, and researchers' allegiance. Do you know how much that can explain the results in psychotherapy student studies? If you sum up, it can explain 70% of the variance in the results. If the researchers believe in the methods. I remember I was talking with Tony in this restaurant, and he said the three th worst things that could happen to him was that his daughter became a Manchester City fan. He's a Manchester United fan. He's a dedicated Manchester City fan. The next worst thing was that his daughter started to work in the pharma industry. And the third worst thing was that he became a psychodynamic. He's a very eager CBT therapist. Why is it important to be open, but also a bit skeptical to new methods? Let's see at how cognitive behavioral therapy and psychosis has developed. We see a large effect sizes at the start when it, it is introduced, and it's falling. That's all therapy. Medication falls, and every psychosocial intervention will fall after the introduction. And the enthusiasm has been faded away. I don't think I... Family work. No studies without medications. Well-documented treatment approach with medication. I think it's the so psychosocial treatment approach that is best documented of the psychosocial interventions. So, what kind of family work are they going to get in Helsingborg, for example? Are they going to get single family treatment, multi family treatment? Are they focused on communi communication skills, uh, and so on? What are they going to get? I, the next slides, I want to illustrate two points. The promotion of psychosocial methods is no better than the medication promote themselves. And it's not good for everyone. As we see, the therapeutic society was bad for the patients with psychosis. It could be that family, or, uh, family intervention or psychotherapy intervention could be bad for the patients. This is a five-year follow-up of patients from the TIPS project. As you can see, those who participated were more psychotic than those who were not offered the treatment or those who refused it. And they spent more time being psychotic than those not offered or refused it. So how are we going to adjust the family approach for patients without medication? There are no studies, of, but what shall we do? The most I wanted to illustrate is that a lot of the psycho social research with negative results are never published. When did you see a psychotherapy or psychosocial intervention which came out with a different results than the main author? That's the first one came in 2000, and now it's some more. This paper was very difficult to publish. It was rejected in four journals. There was a man who had interest in, I got money to implement the methods in a country, and he was the reviewer. But he made a mistake. He sent the same review after we had fixed and adjusted the manuscript to, to, for publication, and we could take contact with the 
the, the editor and say he obviously don't want this to be published. What about antipsychotics? This has been a great uh, part of the debate. On the left side, antipsychotics are dangerous. On the right side, those who want to use them, just use them. That's how we decide. And Robert Whittaker is the Donald Trump of antipsychiatry. <laughs> he said that I could say it, but I didn't say I mean it, but I mean it. <laughs> Yeah? You have to talk fun of no. I asked him before I presented these slides, and he said it was okay. He has been called much worse thing. <laughs> but he, he might be right that antipsychotics is overused. Just a couple of examples. Just a few from his book. Number of free hospitalization increased after we started using antipsychotics. People get worse using antipsychotics. Of course they do. We got an increase in rehospitalization rates. Patient were discharged. Some were rehospitalized. Correlations are difficult. Here is oh, this didn't work. No. You see, the first one on the le left side is total use of uh, antidepressive, and the second graph is how much is on. Uh, uh, disab disability pension. In the right column, there is the Norwegian numbers. Numbers of antidepressive prescribed and number of uh, psychic mental health problems in Norway. There could be several reasons for this co-variation. Robert Vitake is saying, yes, there could be, and acknowledge that there are very many other reasons to this co-variation. He acknowledged that, but he doesn't take it into consideration when he has, he's discussing his results. How would it influence his results? That's missing. That's exactly the same as I read in journals. Disclosure. MM has worked for Eli Lyle, Bristol Myers Squibbs. I don't care how, who they have got the money from. I care about how they have influenced their results. And that's missing. We have a lot of special correlations. I, you might have seen that. Here is correlation between people who drowned after falling off the fishing boat and marriage rate in Kentucky. Strong correlations. US crude oil imports from Norway and drivers killed in collision with railway train. So <laughs> correlations are dangerous. Antipsychotics are dangerous. We must stop prescribing antipsychotics. They are very harmful, and it's a hindrance for patients to get back to normal life. First of all, antipsychotic is effective in improving outcome in short term. That's what Robert Whittaker says. So even Robert Whittaker, I think, is against and think medication rewards is a bad idea. That's something Felis Aksun should think about. What fa fascinates me most is how Whittaker and Goethe critical interpretation of psychopharmacological research and their extremely uncritical positive regards of psychosocial interventions such as open dialogue and psychotherapy. And what fascinates me second is how to use the language. A modern plague, a modern pest, magic bullets, magic pills, prisoners of our neurotransmitters. What's the intention with describing things like that? For me, several red flags is up in the air now. And this is just some couple of the examples. Up to three years, it is clearly well documented that antipsychotics are pretty effective. You agree, Bob? No. No? Thanks. What's next? Ten years? 
20 years, 40 years? If you have shown that they are effective in 10 years, would you then ask for 20 years? Probably, and then 40 years. Do all data in the book, is the whole story presented? I'm not going to get into each of the study he is presenting there because they are described several times elsewhere. You can just look at the internet and uh, use Google to find them. I want to go a bit further to see. Could we look at studies exploring whether those who use antipsychotics live longer than people who don't? Is that a good idea? Yes, I think so. I just searched the Medline this morning and found a lot of interesting studies, which is not mentioned in the book. Shouldn't those be incorporated? Yes, I think so. Actually, one of them were incorporated. This one from 91, Neurolipsis and Natural Cause of Schizophrenia, include 22 papers. And some of the papers in the anatomy of an epidemic is included there but only those who shows negative results. What is this? this is just four studies. I could show you a lot more. What does they show? Mortality was markedly raised in patients not taking antipsychotics, and the risk of suicide was high. Excess mortality is seen mostly in patients not using antipsychotic drugs. Long-term treatment with antipsychotic drug is associated with lower mortality compared with no antipsychotic use. Okay, another thing. Antipsychotic causes psychosis in the long term. Maybe it could increase our knowledge if we looked at the early intervention literature. This is a good idea, I know. How does this look like? You can see this is what we call in uh, the early, early intervention literature duration of untreated psychosis, how long they go without psychosis, start of treatment, and outcome. Several go two years with, without treatment, one year, six months, two years, uh, and so on. Isn't it strange that those who have gone with a psychotic, had, had psychotic symptoms for two years are more severely ill than those who have only got six months? Isn't it? Is it? They seem to deteriorate during that, but they go, doesn't get any antipsychotics. But if the magic bullet is causing the plague, then antipsychotic causes psychosis, then patient with early start should have poor long-term prognosis, shouldn't it? Do you agree with me? If you take a pill who shows that you get poorer prognosis, then you earlier start with the pill, Reverse outcome. Is that clear? Is it right? A pill is not a pill. A pill is not a pill, that's right. But if you use all the antipsychotics and the wrong, is it right that if you use, if antipsychotic medication is causing the plague, the pest, is it right then that if you use them earlier, on, earlier in the treatment methods, they should get worse. That's logical to me. And if that's true, then all the hypothesis in the book is fallen. And we know that early intervention improve outcome. This is from the TIPS project. Those with a duration of untreated psychosis because before they got treatment were recovered in 12%. Those with 11 weeks less improved in 31% of the game. So is the magic bullet really causing the plague? No, it's not. It couldn't be. Suicidality is another important aspect that's not covered in the book at all. This also shows the importance of getting early to treatment. Only a difference between 11 weeks shows that those who have been 
had a duration of enteritis psychosis in 16 weeks, contrary to those who have been uh, psychotic for five weeks, 10 times more had made suicidal attempt. 10 times more is a serious disorder. Have you no idea what it is like to have schizophrenia? Yes, we have. PubMed search, approximately 123 papers, 1,000 papers. Last five years, 5,000 papers. Last year, 1,000 papers. I even can't read them all. We are starting to know something about schizophrenia, vulnerability, risk factors, heredity, and best possible treatment. But we have a long way to go. What's also interesting is what you should imagine of wrong studies statistically. 5% of every published studies should be wrong, and they are. When we are calculating in research, 90, we should be 95% sure that the result is not random. But 5% is random. So if you take the papers, the last five years, 250 papers should tell you something that's wrong. And that you have to take in a, into account. It's not difficult to write a book or something about that, those 250 studies. Research, search again. We have all the time going back to the data and see if you have understood it right. If well-conducted studies support new treatment options, we have to implement it. We need constantly to change our views and beliefs of what is best possible treatment and not harmful. Finally, and luckily, it's not just me. Summing it all up, what other psychiatrists think of medication-free wards? What do the president of the Norwegian Nordic Psychiatric Association and Baltic Association say about medication-free wards? In my opinion, it's difficult to provide treatment without any evidence for its effect. In my opinion, it is better to have patient-free wards, not medicine-free wards. Overview is that this is not good medical practice and would not benefit psychiatric patients. An adequate pharmaceutical regime is re crucial for safety at the in-house treatment facility. There are some areas or hospitals promoting the idea of medicine-free wards, but the reason for this seems more ideological than scientific or medical. Medicine-free wards as an alternative to traditional mental wards are a novel concept that yet has to prove itself. Evidence-based intervention, both medical and psychosocial, should remain the cornerstone of modern treatment strategies in psychiatry. The ambition of improving overall quality of care calls for a more positive definition of the content and the treatment profile rather than the negative delimitation of what should not be in it. So, it sums up. Do you like chocolate? All of you? Sure? Not always? Of course you do. Would you recommend chocolate to others? Yes? Would you? Of course you will. And I want you to think about the last one. Does it cure psychosis? Thank you. So, thank you, Jan Eva Rusberg, and um, I think that uh, following your presentation, we really need a break. <laughs> so, we will now we will now take a ten-minute break, and when I say ten-minute break, I mean a ten-minute break.
Allo, allo. Ja. Hallo, 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 hallo. Kan vi få litt lyd? Nei. Ja, for å se hva som var der. Så, jeg er fint å gå over til jet lag. Hva er lyden da? Hva er lyd? Da er det fint om folk inntar plassene. Please find your seats. Please find your seats and we will proceed in a few seconds. It is of course uh, impossible to have a 10 minute break with so many enthusiastic people in the audience. But uh, 15 minutes isn't so bad either. So as you are now approaching your seats, we can uh, soon proceed. And if in addition to finding your seats, you also stop talking, then we can really go on. Okay, we are, we are getting closer, we are getting very close. And if we can have some silence, then we can actually go on. We're getting still closer, fine. So, uh, I now have, have the pleasure of uh, introducing the next speaker who has come a long way. He has come all across the Atlantic Ocean from a former democracy called the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Robert Whittaker, he is a journalist and author, and he has actually won numerous awards as a, as a journalist covering medicine and science. Maybe the most uh, prominent uh, award he got uh, for his book, who, it, it has already been uh, some quotes from your book. <laughs> um, your book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, in uh, 2010, it won the award, uh, the Investigative Reporters and Editors Book Award for Best Investigative Journalism. Um, and your theme is uh, rethinking and psychotics, recovery rates, and long-term outcomes for unmedicated patients with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So, please. Uh, bear with me just a second. I got to get out of this one and put on the... Uh, it, maybe someone can help me with this. I'll hold it. I got it, I think. Uh, how can I make this large, like this, maybe? Uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. And then the view. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was going to say it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it actually is a pleasure to be here. And I have to say, oh, it's on there, but not on there. Well, I'll just tell him while well, he's getting this set up. You know, I've been called many things in my life, but being called Donald Trump is the biggest insult of all, <laughs> particularly at this time. And then he, when he got down, he says, I could have been harsher, and I don't know what is harsher than being compared to Donald Trump these days. <laughs> okay, and then just get rid of this part on the right. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, gotcha. So, listen, there was a lot said in that first 45 minutes. Um, in terms of the presentation of anything in anatomy, it just wasn't accurate. That's all I can say. We can talk about in the panel, et cetera. But here's what I want to do in the next 45 minutes. I, you know, learning about this initiative that by the government for, quote, medication-free wards, I understand it was as an alternative really to forced treatment and that sort of thing, which is, of course, becomes a rationale for why you want to offer people choice. I think there's another rationale for this, or, and maybe medication-free ward is the wrong word here. The question really is, at this time of 2017, does medication, is there evidence showing that it improves even short-term outcomes. And, but more to the point, how does it affect people's lives over the longer term? Because, of course, initial use often so much leads to use at 5, 10, and 15 years. And so you want to see what history and science can tell us about that very important question about how medications affect people's lives over the long term. And I'm, we're going to be talking about antipsychotics and the reason I wanted to focus, of course, on antipsychotics is when you look at forced treatment, it's usually with antipsychotics. And the other reason is this. If we look at the narrative that drives societal care today, it really forms around antipsychotics more than any other class of drugs. And the conventional narrative goes like this, that prior to the arrival of antipsychotics, People with psychotic disorders were confined to mental hospitals. They didn't get out. And that it was the arrival of antipsychotics that made it possible to start emptying the hospitals into discharge patients. And the other part of that conventional narrative is that antipsychotics are absolutely essential. At least that's the narrative in the United States, both for short term and long term. And really part of the conventional narrative, and you really heard that in the sort of the mocking of me, in the beginning, is that anybody who doubts that truth is a flat earther, non-scientific, that sort of thing. And that's the way that people who challenge that conventional narrative are basically dismissed and treated. Now, I want to notice one point. Did you see any evidence point presented in the first 45 minutes that showed antipsychotics improve long-term outcomes? Did you even see evidence that it shows that they really are effective over the short term. Okay, it wasn't an evidence-based presentation. So what I'd like to do here is go over the evidence base that surrounds this question, okay? And here's the questions we want to look at. Where, first of all, we want to, in that conventional narrative, what were the hospital discharge rates, uh, and I'm, I have some Norwegian data, in the decade prior to the arrival of the first antipsychotics. So the antipsychotic chlorpromazine is introduced into medicine in 1955, and this is the start of the psychopharmacological era. And in the conventional narrative, this is seen as kicking off a great psychopharmacological revolution, a great advance in care. So we want to see, is that true? Did people prior to the arrival of antipsychotics not get out, first episode psychotic patients, and did the arrival increase the discharge rates? Because if the conventional narrative is true, that's what we should see, okay? And that's the second part. Did these discharge rates notably improve after the arrival of this drug? Which really, and we're talking about first episode patients, so we wanna see if the use of these medications were effective in essence over the short term. You see point number three? Um, this goes to the question, is here we are in 2017, okay? 
Um, is there evidence, in fact, that when you use these drugs with first episodes psychotics patients, that it improves outcomes at one year? Do we have that evidence in the evidence base after 55 years? Now, most people would say it must be there, but we'll look to see if it is indeed there. And then finally, the most important thing is I'm going to go over studies, uh, a number of studies that have been done that have reported on outcomes for non-compliant patients or unmedicated patients versus those who are compliant and medicated patients on a number of domains, okay? And we're just going to present the evidence. And before I even get into one thing on this, no one is arguing for no treatment. <laughs> no one is saying let people have psychotic and not have some form of care. So the whole question is what form of care, especially once you start in that first moment, say you have a psychotic episode and enter the system, what sort of care helps put you on the best long-term course? So remember that idea, okay? So in 1956, the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, which is our agency for researching uh, psychiatric disorders, okay? It's, it's our premier agency. They convened a meeting and they said, how are we going to know if these new drugs are effective? And they said, well, we have to figure out what are the outcomes we are getting today, and then we can see what are the outcomes we're going to start getting in the future. But we need to know what outcomes we're getting today before we can see if this new therapy improves on those outcomes, okay? So just so you know, I didn't cherry pick this data. This was the data presented at that 1956, mo uh, 1956 meeting, and you'll see something surprising. What you find from 1945 to 1955, if you study first episodes, people diagnosed with schizophrenia at that time, you'll see that 60, 65 percent would be discharged within 12 to 18 months. You see that in these two studies. And then even more important is what percentage of the patients were living independently outside of the hospital in these first episode cohorts at the end of three and five years. And you'll see one is 73 percent, one is 70 percent. This is before the drug era. Now what happens even in this data, if you have 100 patients come in, say in 1948, 65 are discharged, what are you left with? You're left with 35 who did not get out, and that becomes part of your chronic population. But you're forgetting about the capacity, so to speak, to recover over time that you saw in these hospital settings. So just my point here is, the conventional narrative that remembers that people didn't get well at all before the introduction of antipsychotics is not born in the data. Now here's your Norwegian data. So this was uh, a study of, I think, all the hospitals that gathered all the data in the hospitals for patients who were treated in this four years for functional psychoses, and then they looked at the status of the patients in, at the end of December 31st, 1953. Okay, and what do you find? You find that some per a small percentage died in the hospital, transferred to other cares, like to other facilities, still in the hospital, but look at this. So you do have a group that is discharged, and then they get readmitted, they have a relapse. What do you see here? These people were discharged and never came back to the hospital, and you did not have a disability system or a social service system that was providing sort of you know, financial support. So what you see in your own data for that time is, in fact, people prior to having the antipsychotics, uh, a significant percentage recovering and staying out of the hospital, okay? So now the next question is, chlorpromazine, I think you called it Largactyl, right here in, in, in Norway, I'm not sure, but the first antipsychotic is, is chlorpromazine, and we had one study done in the United States at that time to see if this was now going to improve discharge rates. It was done at the, by the state of California. They looked at all their first episode patients in 1956, and then they looked at the end of 18 months, what were the discharge rates? And this was where some hospitals weren't using the drugs left so much or at all, and s others that had really adopted it. And what they found was that the discharge rate for those not treated with antipsychotics, this is first episode schizophrenia patients, was 88% in, in 18 months. It was actually a little higher than it was for those treated with antipsychotics. So what did the researchers conclude? Just read it. Can you all read this? Is it big enough? I want you to read the researchers' words and not my words, okay? 
because apparently I'm not a very good with the truth if I'm Donald Trump. <laughs> but you can see what they say is the untreated patients, untreated, consistently show a somewhat lower retention rate. Now here's your data from Norway. Here was the comparison made of this very question by Norwegian researchers. So they looked and they said, okay, well, here's all the people that were admitted. These are big numbers too. You see the numbers of functional psychosis? I think this is from all your Norwegian hospitals that in the entire country. So what do you see? Discharged and not readmitted. And it's the same time thing. So you have four years and then they're looking at the end of the fifth year. They're basically the same, right? There's no big difference. So in other words, we're not seeing an improvement in first episode patients in terms of discharge from the hospital being better. How about by functional, uh, by individual diagnosis? Here's before the introduction of chlorpromazine and here's the after. What do you see? Do you see a great improvement in discharge rates? There's two messages here. One, are we really seeing an improvement? But the other is, remember that many people with time that have a psychotic episode and treatment of some sort, uh, get better, okay? Now, this is the most, uh, I was asked, do I believe that antipsychotics have been shown to be effective over the short term? Now, in anatomy of an epidemic, I said, yeah, that's the data, okay? I didn't really want to take this question on. But the Cochrane Collaboration, do you all know about the Cochrane Collaboration? It's an international group of researchers that is supposed to review the research literature and say, what does it say to us? Now, if you look at studies on short-term efficacy, there are a lot of studies, hundreds. But here's how they're designed. And this is how every study of the new atypical antipsychotics was designed. You take people who are on drugs, okay? Then you yank them all off the drug. You randomize half to placebo. You randomize the other half back on drug. And then you see who has a greater remission of psychotic symptoms at the end of six weeks. Now, one reason you yank them off is because you want psychotic symptoms to increase. Okay? And that way we can, you need them actively psychotic to see if the drugs are going to work. And that becomes the rationale, the design for short-term efficacy. So what's the problem with that design? The problem is the placebo group is not a placebo group. It's a drug withdrawal group. And we actually all know that coming off drugs is abruptly is a really bad idea. And by the way, some of the suicide data of people released from hospitals that stopped taking drugs, that is attributed to being off med. They're going through withdrawal. So what the Cochrane Collaboration did, they canvassed the literature that is around for 50 years and they said, how about studies in medication naive people where it compares drug to uh, some other form, either placebo, psychosocial care, milieu therapy. You know how many studies they could find? Five. In 50 some years. To see if people had a better outcome at one year with initial exposure to antipsychotics. Five only with a total of 900 patients. And what did they conclude? Read it. So this is not me. But they are saying, the Cochrane Collaboration, this international group of researchers saying it is 2000, I think this was 11, we don't have evidence that in fact these drugs in a medication-naive group improve outcomes at one year. We do not have that evidence. Next. So now really I'm going to start getting just into the long-term outcome data in, in the time I have. One of the, uh, the, the, the one main retrospective study we have that was funded by the NIMH was done by a man named Samuel Bakoven. And he had been, a, a, a re, he had been at Boston Psycho Health, uh, Myas Boston Psychopathic Hospital in 1947, when people were treated with a lot of psychosocial care, but we didn't have the drugs yet, and he had five-year outcomes for that. And then he matched it to a cohort of first-episode patients treated in 1967 with drugs and also psychosocial care. And here's what he found when he did this retrospective study. There was a little a greater relapse rate in the modern 
era, in other words, more rehospitalization. But the most important thing he found was that the 67 cohort was much less socially dependent, more, much, excuse me, much more socially dependent. Their functional outcomes were not nearly as good. So in 1947, 76% were successfully living in the community at the end of five years. Here they were much more uh, on welfare, et cetera. So what does Samuel Bachoven, I hope you all have your reading glasses, okay? What does he say? And focus on rather unexpectedly. He's not expecting this outcome. Their extended use in aftercare may prolong the social dependency of many discharged patients. That's a retrospective study, okay? Now we want to see other studies in the modern era, and I'm going to try to find basically every study I can that compares longer-term outcomes for medicated and unmedicated patients, okay? And the unmedicated patients in general are going to be people who took themselves off, not in every case. Now, this is one of the five studies that was identified by the Cochrane Collaboration as co providing a comparison for medication-naive people, first episode people who were either treated conventionally or without drug. So the way the study was designed, people came into the hospital, first episode, and they either were put on antipsychotic or they were just not put on antipsychotic, okay? Then they're discharged, and he follows them for three years. And here's what this means. You see where it says, and it's randomized, okay? This is a randomized study. So people get randomized either to treatment or no drug treatment. No meds means no meds during the hospital care. Off means they stayed off medication in the three years after discharge. Antipsychotic off meant antipsychotic in the hospital, and then they went off on their own when they were discharged. No meds means, they were again, no meds in the hospital. And then in the, dis, in the after period, they went on the drugs. And so that's the two parts, okay? So what do you see in this data? What group had the best outcomes? It was the group, roughly two-thirds, who weren't exposed to antipsychotics in the hospital and stayed off afterwards. So that's about 67%. What do we see in terms of recovery rates before the introduction of antipsychotics? Antipsychotic? About 60%, right? 65%. So you're seeing, I think, here a natural recovery rate. All right? And so basically, two-thirds are getting better. Which group has the worst outcome? Which has the highest rehospitalization rate? Antipsychotics on. Okay? Just one study. And this was confounded by a higher dropout rate uh, initially in the uh, group in no meds. So there is that confounding factor. What does he conclude, though, about his own study? And again, please read. This is one of the only five studies done that compares in medication-naive longer-term outcomes. And he says the key here is if we're interested in long-term improvement, long-term, that may be different than short-term, okay? But that's one of the five studies. Next, this was a very famous study. Uh, you heard about it a little bit in the beginning. This was a study designed by Lauren Mosher. Lauren Mosher was the head of schizophrenia studies at the NIMH at this time. So he's our top schizophrenia doctor. Uh, it was a randomized study. So people come into the hospital. There, some of them arrive with handcuffs and all. And then they're going to be randomized either to treatment as usual in the hospital with drugs, or they're going to be randomized to a house which is staffed by ordinary people, non-professionals actually. Now, it's not a no-med protocol. Here was the protocol. They would try not to put people on, they would not put people on antipsychotics right away in the Soteria house. They would use benzodiazepines if people couldn't sleep, okay? And then if people weren't getting better, after a week or two or deteriorating, then they would initiate antipsychotic use. So it was a, meant to be a selective use model for the medications. All right. Project ran 12 years. Uh, for, this is the N is the number of people treated at the Soteria project. By the way, a, a, small, a small aside fact, the man who really ran the project was Voice Hendricks, Jimi Hendricks's cousin. And 
if you want to see why staffing can be so important, you should invite Jimmy, uh, Voice Hendricks here sometime, and you'll be charmed by this person. He's a very, he has a warmth that is extraordinary. So here's the results. At six weeks, Soteria Project was just a, as effective form of care as drug care in a hospital in terms of reducing psychotic symptoms. That's the first one. At the end of two years, as a whole, this approach produced better outcomes. They had lower psychopathology scores, fewer readmissions, and better global adjustment. And here is the antipsychotic use. Because they delayed initial use, about 40% never needed to go on. Think of it as an escape valve. And then there was another 40% that did need the medication temporarily for a period of time. And then it seemed like there was 20% of people that really did benefit from, needed it continuously. So it really is talking about a selective use model, and here's the key. With first episode, if you can have a, a form of care that allows this group that doesn't, you know, can get better without medications, if you can let that to happen, you can improve your overall uh, outcomes. What does Lauren Mosher say? What does our top schizophrenia doctor say? So you can read it. I don't know if he was an early Donald Trump or what, but uh, you can read it. It's his own, his, own, his own conclusion. And he says we need to re-examine this. Real quickly, then, we have cross-cultural studies. These were studies done by the World Health Organization in the 1970s and 1980s. These studies were done like this. They compared outcomes in three, quote, developing countries, India, Colombia, and Nigeria, with outcomes in the U.S. and other rich countries. There was at least one Scandinavian country that had a site in this. Diagnosis is being made by Western doctors. And here's what happened. After the first study, which I think was the five-year studies, they noted that the patients in the poor countries had much better outcomes, a considerably better course. And then they conclude that being in a developed country was a strong predictor of not attaining a complete remission in a rich country. Okay? And then in the poor countries, they had an exceptionally good outcome. Because, and now after that first study, here's what the WHO, World Health Organization investigators, hypothesized. Maybe the outcomes are better in the poor countries because they're more medication compliant. They take their antipsychotics regularly. Valid hypothesis, right? If drugs are to be so essential, then compliance should be associated with better outcomes. So they measured medication usage in the second study, and what did they find? They found that in the poor countries, they were using the drugs differently. They were using them acutely, but not chronically. So only 16% of patients were kept on the, on the drugs long term, whereas, of course, that's the standard of care in the uh, rich countries. Now, they go back at 15 to 20 years, and they look up this cohort of patients. And what do they find? The outcome differential holds up the general clinical state, symptomatology, disability, and social functioning. And look at this. Remember these data as we go forward. 53% were never psychotic anymore, they're off, and 73% were employed. Um, I'm not going to present this data. There's a new uh, international study funded by Eli Lilly. I think it's uh, 11,000 patients in 37 countries. The point of this study is everybody has to be on medication for three years, cross-cultural, and now the outcomes in the poor countries, developing countries, are no longer better than in the rich countries. In fact, they're now a little worse. But it's not that the outcomes in the rich countries have come up, it's that the outcomes in the poor countries as they've adopted this new model have come down. This is the best long-term study we have done in the, in, the, in the United States. It was done by a psychologist at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, the University of Medicine, and a psychiatrist named Tom Job. His name is Martin Harrell. Here's how the study was designed. He enrolls 200 patients with psychotic diagnoses from two area hospitals, one private, one public. That way he gets a diverse group. And now, and everybody will be treated conventionally in the hospital with drugs. They're discharged, and now he's just going to follow them at two years, four and a half, seven and a half, 10, 15, 20, and 25 years, and look how they're doing. Now, one of the hypotheses was that those who stop taking their medication will be doing terribly. They're going to be homeless. He's going to see that this shows, in fact, it confirms why you need to be on your drugs. At the end of 15 years, he still had 145 of his 200 patients in the study. That is a really low dropout rate for a schizophrenia study in the United States. And you'll see he has 64 schizophrenia patients diagnosed by DSM-3, 81 with milder psychotic disorders. Fortunately, this is a young group. 
most are either first or second hospitalization, so he's getting them, he's following them early in the course of the illness. Now, I'm going to, there's data at 20 years, some at 15 years, etc. So, this is in the 64 schizophrenia patients. At the end of two years, roughly 25 of the 64 patients had schizophrenia patients had stopped taking their medications against doctor's orders, okay? They basically had left care. And you'll see, they're anxious. They're actually a little bit more anxious than the group on antipsychotics. But what happens between year two and four and a half? Do you see what happens? There's a lot of healing going on, recovery going on in the off antipsychotic group. Their anxiety is abating, whereas it's not in the uh, on, on group. This is the only place in the literature I know of you really see a time course of healing in basically between two and a half to five years. It gives you a different perspective. How about cognitive function? It's better at every follow-up for the off-med group. This is the psychotic symptoms. So at 10 years, he looks at the people who are at least off antipsychotics at that time versus those who are on. What do you see here? First of all, a lot of people off are not psychotic. But does this show drugs that are working on the psychotic symptoms? The majority are still psychotic, taking the meds. How about recovery rates? Recovery rates you defined you had to be asymptomatic when you came, you couldn't have been in the hospital in the previous year at this moment, and you had to have, uh, you had to either be working or in school at least 50% of the time and have relatively good social functioning. You see again at two years, there's not much difference. The divergence happens between year two and four and a half. And by year four and a half, the recovery rate is eight times higher for those off medication. And what Harrell found was this. The people who recovered off medication disappeared. The psychiatrists didn't see them. And actually, society didn't see them because they got off. He had someone become a lawyer, someone became a professor. They, once they recovered, they didn't go around saying, hey, you know what, I used to have schizophrenia. So we don't see this, is what he's saying. Now, this is a slide that I did put together from his data because he ends up with four groups. And he just talks about, he has a scale called global adjustment. He has, he has schizophrenia on and off, and he has other milder disorders on and off. So the group with mild disorders had a better prognosis at baseline, okay? They weren't as ill, and they should have an expected better outcome. So how did the outcomes match up? Well, the worst was schizophrenia on meds. The next worst was milder disorders on meds. So milder disorders on meds ended up worse than schizophrenia off meds. Now that belies an easy explanation that it was just a difference in initial severity of symptoms because that goes counter to what you would expect. Okay? Again, you read what the researcher concluded by his own long-term study. Not my conclusion. Okay? He said this in 2008. Now, he has subsequently done a really interesting thing. He's looked at, he, he went into a schizophrenia patients, and then he looked at people who were off by year two and stayed off the whole time, and then he looked at patients who were medication compliant during the whole time. And what did he see with psychotic symptoms? Which group do you see the abatement in? Which group is doing much less psychotic over time? It's the group that got off by year two and never went back on the meds. But you also see, again, the people on meds, the compliant people, have a lot of psychotic symptoms. This is the work history, same thing in these two groups, those who were either on meds all the time or off meds. You'll see that the group off meds, the employment rates are quite high, not so high with those off meds. I point this out because really what he found was this. You needed to get off the meds pretty early on to have this good outcome. That's what he really found. So here's what our leading researcher in the United States, funded by the NIMH, concluded after his long-term study. Okay? Next. The complaint about uh, Harrell was that it wasn't randomized. Uh, we have a sort of randomized study done by out of the Netherlands. Here was the design. You get first episode patients who are stable for six months on antipsychotics, and now they're randomized either to a, a dose reduction a discontinuation arm or treatment as usual. So the randomization is this. 
It's a randomization of a moment in time to a different treatment protocol. But once that happens, as he follows them for the next seven years, it's going to, uh, you know, pe it'll, people will be free to go off medication or on regardless of what group they're in. But how does that treatment decision play out? Now, if you stop this study here, what do you see? You see that there's a higher relapse rate in the drug withdrawn group or the drug uh, tapered group, okay? You stop it here, you say this is a bad idea because there's higher relapse rates. But in this study, the relapses weren't so severe. They managed them, and now they looked at relapse rates at seven years. Not much difference. How about recovery rates? The group randomized to drug discontinuation or tapering had 40% recovery rate versus 18. So at least in this study, that moment of treatment where you tried to introduce tapering led to a doubling of the recovery rate. And now I also, you also see that some of the people randomized to drug um, discontinuation or tapering, and they either got down to a low dose or off. Some, of the, some, well, some in that group actually went back on conventional medications, and some in the other group randomized the treatment as usual, took themselves off. So this is just the, the seven-year results based on medication use. And you see the group that got down to low dose or off, greater symptom remission, greater functional remission, and greater three times the full recovery rate. Here's what he says. By the way, how much time do I have? I, I need to know what I should... You're going to have to read fast. <laughs> okay, you see he... How much? Left, or I've taken 32. Uh-oh, I better go. Okay, you'll see here he's saying he's worried that antipsychotics may worsen functional outcomes, okay? And then next, he's saying we've been looking at the long thing. We've just been measuring symptoms over the short term. We need to look at how people are living over longer periods of time. All right, that's his conclusion. Functional gains only appeared in long-term monitoring. This is a study out of Denmark. It was a study where they looked at 496 first episode schizophrenia patients diagnosed between these years. Early on in the course, at time of recruitment, been on antipsychotics less than 12 weeks. At 10 years, there's still 303 patients in the study. There were 121 who were non-compliant. They weren't following their doctor's orders, stopped taking antipsychotics. So he gets two groups at 10 years, those who are non-compliant and the compliant patients. And he says, at baseline, there was no difference between these two groups, severity of illness, et cetera. Okay, here's the outcomes. Blue is non-compliant. Uh, the red is compliant. Which group has a greater remission rate? Non-compliant. Which group is more likely to be employed? Non-compliant. Anyway, that was the Danish OPA study. This is another study. It's called the Finnish birth cohort study. And the way this study works is they had been following people born in 1966 in northern Finland, I think across a lot of health uh, outcomes. But they had 70 people in that cohort who were diagnosed with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, okay? And now they're just going to look at how is that cohort doing in the year 2000? And they're 34 years old. You see medium uh, illness. Of the 70, 46 were taking antipsychotics in 2000, 24 who were off. And then the group is then followed for another 8.7 years. What's the outcome? Which group is doing better? Which group of, in this cohort study is more likely to be in remission, employed, have a social factory, and which group is more likely to be on disability? You see, it's the non-compliant group, once again, that had better outcomes. And this is just the rehospitalization rates during the nine-year follow-up. Uh, there's not a, a great, I would say there's not a great deal, deal of difference there. So when we started this, and I was trying to do a very quick review of a long evidence-based history, do we see, prior to the introduction of antipsychotics, what do we see? We see that more than 60% of patients were discharged. And we would see at longer-term follow-ups, about at least two-thirds or more would be living independently in the community. And what that does for the debate you're having in Norway, it provides a possibility that needs to be uh, part of the debate around medication-free wards, if that's what you want to, you know, if that's the term. Because really, I think you're talking about rethinking antipsychotics and rethinking whether you really should be forcing people on these drugs, particularly in then over long term. So we need to know that many people got better naturally, okay, in the absence of antipsychotics. 
you'll see that we do not find in the discharge rates that they notably improve after the introduction of the drug. You'll see we still do not have compelling evidence that the drug improve outcomes at the end of one year in real studies. And then finally, on long-term outcome studies that look at how people are functioning time and time again, what you find is, is the non-compliant patients are functioning better, they're more likely to be employed, they're less likely to be on disability, and actually they're less likely to be symptomatic. And what that data tells you, imagine we had a system of care that helped people become medication-free. In other words, maximize the possibility that they could be in this drug-free good outcome group. Now, I don't believe everybody will end up in that group. I don't believe that. But I believe you need to have a system of care that maximizes the possibility for the individual to end up with that life. And think about the 20-year-old that has a psychotic break. What do you want to do for that 20-year-old? What do you want to do as a society? Do you want to turn him into a lifelong patient that has to take antipsychotics for the rest of his life? Or do you want to give that person the best chance possible to have had a time of psychosis, a time of an episode, and get a full life back that involves uh, functioning well, employment, that sort of thing, and not suffering the adverse effects of the drugs? That's what we're talking about here, is if you rethink this around some sort of selective model, you try to remember is, what is the possibility for getting this type of recovery. And what the evidence base is telling us is there's a lot of possibility. And in fact, our modern view that it, these, this, these disorders, these psychotic disorders run a chronic course naturally is not true. They run a chronic course today pretty much, but that's a chronic course in medicated patients. So again, I know I was seen as just an idiot in the first presentation. It's not me. Who is this guy? Peter Tyra, editor, British Journal of Psychiatry. This is not, and, and what is, I'm going to read this part. It is time to reappraise the assumption that antipsychotics must always be the first line of treatment for people with psychosis. Favorite part of this. This is not a wild cry from the distant outback, that's me, but a considered opinion of influential researchers. There is an increasing body of evidence that the adverse effects of antipsychotic treatment are, to put it simply, not worth the candle. Now, I also run a, a website called uh, Mad in America where we publicize this research and we publicize the voices of people with lived experience. We recently uh, posted a letter uh, written, an essay written by Sir Robin Murray of the UK. He is the most prominent psychiatrist, skip related to schizophrenia in the whole country. And what he says is, he goes, the title is the mistakes, the mistakes I Made. And among the many mistakes he talks about, he basically says the counter narrative that is in anatomy of an epidemic, we should be paying attention to it. And you heard in the first talk about how, oh, is there any possibility that drugs increase the vulnerability to psychosis? Well, Sir Robin Murray in his post goes, we began to worry about this in 1978. And he's right, that's when they did. And the biology of this was this. The antipsychotics block dopamine receptors. In response to that blockade, the brain increases the number of its receptors. It's now said to be sen super sensitive to dopamine. And our lead researcher, one of our lead researchers in 1978 says this, William Carpenter. We know that once you're on drugs, if you come off, you're at greater uh, risk of relapse. But we raise the possibility, but then he says, but what if people had never been treated with drugs to begin with? We raise the possibility that antipsychotics over the long term make people more biologically vulnerable to psychosis than they would be in the normal course of their illness. Now that's what I was talking about in Anatomy of an Epidemic. You have Martin Harrell using that very biological explanation to explain his data. You have the head of, uh, from the National Institute of Mental Health recently saying, Tom Insel, we have to ask ourselves whether these drugs are worsening long-term outcomes, not me. And Sir Robin Murray, when he talks about the mistakes that were made, he says, we ignored this worry about dopamine supersensitivity. Now in 2010, when my book was published, 
I was called a heretic. And there were some really nasty reviews. There really were. My favorite was where I was compared to an AIDS denier. And by, I, I was compared to a, not just an AIDS denier, but a South African dictator who by virtue of uh, denying AIDS was causing thousands of people to die. And if you read this book, that's the danger of this book. What I see has happened in the past six years, as more data come on, as I've moved from a heretic to hopefully being forgotten, as psychiatrists themselves, the leaders, start investigating these outcome studies and start thinking about how do we use these medications differently to improve long-term outcomes. So you in Norway have opened the door to a different thinking. And all I can say with the, I understand the forced treatment rationale behind that. But as you think of what to do as a country, think is if rather than even just medication-free wards, can you think about how to, how can you use these medications over the long term to get some of these better outcomes we see in these studies? Okay, thank you. So thank you, Robert Whitaker. And so now we move to the other end of the Atlantic Ocean again, to, to our friends and neighbors from Finland. So I'm introducing Professor Jaakko Saikula, who is a Finnish professor of psychotherapy, and he has won quite a lot of fame for developing what is called the open dialogue approach to, to treatment. Um, your title is Open Dialogue with Families, Increase Resources for Avoiding Unnecessary Medication and Improve the Outcome in Psychotic Crisis. So please. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation for this very, very interesting seminar. I'm lucky to be still living in a democracy, even if it's, it's not, a, not always things happen in the way that we want them to happen, but that's the case. So my point of view tonight is a bit different compared to the first two ones because my main idea is not to focus on medication or not, but my research, I think of myself being a scientist and my science and research is uh, very much uh, a kind of becoming a part of developing psychiatric practices. And, uh, and when we have been doing this research about open dialogue and also many other issues, we also, as a part of it, has come known about the role of uh, medication in psychosis, also in depression, even if that's not pointed out here. So, and uh, it's much more a kind of uh, an idea that I thought to present here is the idea of, uh, of giving a bit new kind of view of how science and research should be a part of developing our practices. There really is a big problem in the science that it used in the academic ways and also that is very much behind of the recommendation of, uh, of uh, treatment of excellence guidelines. And this uh, science and research that is shown in those studies is very much non-valid. The external validity of the studies is very poor and thus giving a kind of guidelines and conclusions for the treatment that seems not to be so valid of the of the real practice. Open dialogue uh, is very much based on a research, all the time ongoing research. In, in that way, you could say that it's a, it's a very much scientifically based approach on the whole. Uh, actually, I don't know any other approach in, within psychiatry that has been studied so much that open dialogue has happened. It's a question of doing a naturalistic research, looking at what, what happens in the real world 
in the practice that we live with our clients. It's not a laboratory design in which we isolate the phenomenon that we want to look in a kind of laboratory comparison between different el elements. And it very much emphasizes the research of the external validity, meaning that the things that we make a research about are the things that happens in the real clinical practice on the, so on the whole. The design are done according to the specific context and specific methods, and it's also a question of, uh, of uh, as it's called, mixed methods idea of integrating different uh, methods of research within the same studies. So I want to uh, show you some of these studies that are behind. There is also uh, quite a many of uh, references to a studies that are not so relevant in, in our meeting for today, but I only want to give a short glimpse to, to see that how this research and uh, evidence based on the research as being a part of the idea. When we do this, uh, there is very important to realize that it's possible to do research of also international therapies. I mean that uh, kind of therapeutic approaches that do not have follow a manual that you have to follow from one case to another, but you really can make a research what happened in the very unique interaction with each client and follow it. You need to do follow-up of the outcomes, of course, in some way. You need to do some comparison between comparison group or between uh, even a historical way or be, do some theories. And uh, then it's very important to make a kind of analysis of the concrete cases, what happens in the treatment to be known, what really is the happenings of the ideas. We are used very much of this uh, kind of, that is called extreme case analysis idea, making a comparison of a cases that we know that have become a good and not, not so good outcomes in the treatment. And then the last, po last point to integrating the results of the cases. Some of the studies that we have done focus on the development of the new system in Lapland. The first uh, very big research project was very early in our, by the way, you realize of the, of the, of the results. There was, uh, in the first presentation, there was this uh, slide of uh, referring that open dialogue is a kind of wave that comes and, uh, and, and goes down, but it's really going on 30 years and it's really based on the research and the first studies was done already 80, uh, in the beginning of 80. We were very interested in what happens in the boundary between the hospital when someone of the ho family is hospitalized and what happens in the cooperation between the, between the family and the hospital. And we called this international idea by naming it as a system of boundary, meaning that on the boundary there is creating some kind of new uh, uh, appearance of communication and interaction that is possible to understand only among those who participate, the family, the doctors, the team who are meeting with the, with the clients. We realize that there is a big difference between the first time patients who have a reference to hospital compared to those who are reoccurring coming back to the hospital but still living active social life and then the third group of those long term patient who, who, whose life being ill has become a very important part. Uh, we realized that uh, it's very important to have the first meeting in a team work because in a team you only have access to look at the social network around the clients and not only focusing on the symptoms as it happens when a doctor alone is doing the admission in interview. And that was the first time we started to pay attention of the dialogical quality of the interaction that happens in the, in the meeting. We also learned that it's very important to not to try to force the families to accept the treatment idea that the therapist seem, seem a good one, but uh, accept their point of view how to go, go on. The next important studies were based on, 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 on psychosis, and of course this is the main part of the presentation for, the, for today also. There are uh, three different uh, cohorts of, for first episode of psychotic patients that we have followed. Two of them followed five years, and, uh, and uh, then in addition, the last one for, for, for two years. Uh, first being a part of a, of a, of a 
Finnish national research of uh, integrated treatment of uh, psychosis. And the idea in that research, I will tell you more detail about the outcome, was to also to clarify what is the role of antipsychotic medication in treatment of psychosis, and that was a kind of quasi-experimental design. Three sites were starting the medication and following the standard care of, uh, of using the medication, and three sites followed the idea not to start the medication in the beginning, but to postpone start of the medication and look if this psychosocial intervention did not help enough. We decided to go on with that uh, and uh, took 94 to 97, our own acute uh, first episode psychotic patients and, and, and followed all these five years. And then the, the third one was 10 years after the look, if, if there really is the case that we found out 10 years before is still the case. But uh, before that, what happens was a very important research. It was uh, led by Professor Jukka Altonen because we had been running this uh, new kind of open system of care, meaning that, uh, that everything that happens in the treatment happens in open forum. Every discussions about the patients happen that the one who is in, uh, the main person is there from the very beginning. Families are always invited into the treatments. And these individual meetings were stopped in a way that we emphasized the working in teams. So the doctors, psychologists, nurses, social workers came together in the, in the meeting. And when this has been going on some 10 years, we made an analysis by looking at patient records how is this uh, affecting the treatment of, uh, of, the, of, of psychotic patients? And we really did a very large analysis by analyzing 3,000 patient records, especially selecting 300 of them who had first-time psychotic patients, and then doing a qualitative content analysis to analyze what are the optimal ingredients of the treatment in these new ideas. And this is something that later on became known as uh, principles of open dialogue. But it's very important for me that uh, principles of open dialogue are not an idea that are first put there and then followed, but the opposite. They are outcomes of looking what happens in the new system of care. And what we found out was that an optimal care seems to include at least seven very important ideas. First of all, the optimal care should guarantee the immediate start within the crisis and actually meeting, having the first meeting within the first day after the contact has been made. Secondly, it always should include the family, and we name it the social network perspective because there is also sometimes reason to have some other part of the social network of the clients being involved. Every time, always. And the third point, it should be flexible, adapting to the unique needs of every client in a way that it integrates the different treatment. Open dialogue has not compensated any treatment methods. Medication, for instance, can be a part of the treatment if, if uh, seen necessary. It should guarantee the responsibility so that the system is available for the family all day round whenever they need for help and that they can be for sure of the help that whenever, wherever they contact, they know that this contact will lead into a meeting with the family. We stopped, we learned to stop to say to the family that uh, this belongs not to us, you need to contact abuse clinic. So it was no longer possible to say that this is not our case, you have to go to another place, but really to start to work in a crisis. It, and in that way, guarantee the psychological <coughs> continuity <coughs> going across the boundaries of different services by forming integrated teams people could work together so that there was someone from the social care, someone from the, from the outpatient clinic, and even some from the hospital, and this team could take charge of the entire treatment for as long time as needed. And then the two last points was that uh, the idea for building up this kind of very intensive meeting was to increase the tolerance of uncertainty for the period of time in which there are no ready-made solutions or conclusions how to go on. And for that reason, the idea is to generate dialogue. The idea 
of the meetings is not so much to f solve the problems, find solutions, find interpretation of meaning, but the idea of the meeting is to generate dialogue to understand more how is this problem related with the life and uh, things that had happened there. And uh, this was also very much on the, this was the first time that we were thinking with Professor Jukka Altonen that how could we name this idea and then we came into a conclusion in 1995 that perhaps we could n give a name as an open dialogues to this system. Uh, that was also opening to see what is the, what is the importance of uh, dialogical quality dialogues in the, in the treatment and there are many studies of, uh, of the of the importance of dialogue. And that is very important. Of course, I could speak quite a lot about it because it's so important element. Realizing now, 20 years after that, uh, that this uh, dialogical way of being with our clients, it's very different compared to the way that we are used to think when we are, when we are meeting with our clients based on our education and specialization and expertise. When we are experts, we know that uh, we have some uh, uh, methods to use for the symptoms, for the problems, for the family interaction to make change. But when we are in a dialogical way with our clients, it's our task to become involved or be involved in the stories of our clients and by our responses helping to have a new shared experience and, uh, and idea of how to, how to go on. Uh, there are many studies. We also have systematized a bit of this. For instance, in one study, we realized that, uh, that this was a study that uh, I conducted myself. And I made a comparison. This is an example of the good and poor outcome. We had an outcome of the, pe of the people who came into the treatment because of psychosis for the first time. And, and then why one idea was to look at that what happens in the first meeting with the one who had a good outcome compared to those who had a poor outcome. And they were selected so that there was a pair comparison out of these cases. And it's very important to realize that those who had a, who had a, who had a good outcome, they have access to be active to define how do we deal with our problems. And that was much less the case in the poor outcome cases. So it was much more the professionals that were active in that situation. There was also a difference in the idea of a symbolic la language, and this is quite <laughs> dramatic because in the poor outcome situation, the way of discussion was almost only discussing of the occasion and decisions and the concrete issues of the treatment, and not at all of how, what kind of meaning do we have of the misery in our life or of other issues. And also the last point that we realized that it's very helpful to have access, as we call dialog dialogical way of being in the dialogue, that it's our responses that are the main parts of going on and not so, as, uh, not so much that it's the professional who de define how, what is the way to go on in, this, in, the, in the system. Uh, when we, yeah, I, I skipped that. Then going into the idea of these uh, studies about, uh, about uh, psychosis. And uh, this, is the, this is the study, first part of the, uh, of the three uh, research studies of first-time psychotic patients. And uh, we followed in two periods altogether from uh, no, April 92 to, till uh, March 97 first time psychotic patients with two big aims in this. This really was a naturalistic study. There was a comparison, a kind of quasi-experimental design that I will show later on. And one aim w was really to increase treatment outside the hospital in home setting and in that way develop the practice on the whole. And then the second aim was to have more information what is the role of medication in, in, the, in the idea. We followed, we started with 90 patients, at the two-year follow-up there were 80, and a five-year all over 76 of them. And for me, this is very important, the last point, that, uh, that uh, we always do the studies 
of outcomes in a way that in the follow-up interviews there are invited the one who is the patient, the family, and the team who is in charge of the treatment. So it's very important that the people who work have a feedback of their work immediately when they are involved. That's a part of this naturalistic uh, way of doing studies and make the increase the external validity of the study to make it, make it also part of the practice. Uh, well, I perhaps is not so. I, I will not go so much into the details of this de, uh, of the of these uh, participants, but only some conclusions. First of all, our interest was that can we really increase the 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 treatment outside the hospital, and that really was the case. If we if we follow the ideas of uh, of uh, two periods, the first period of time. 92, 90, uh, 93, compared to those who came into the second period of research. In both periods, both in two years and between two and uh, five years, those who came later in the treatment, they were much less hospitalized. About 50% of the first-time psychotic patients had some hospitalization, but uh, on, the, on the later period, they were short hospitalization. Actually, there were almost none who were on hospi in hospital more than 10 days. And of course, we can see that this systematic development of the home treatment has increased the tolerance or uncertainty of the professionals that they could take care of very difficult situation more at home without the need of reacting of hospitalization or not even the medication. And then the question was that, uh, that uh, how, are, how is the role of medication compared to the, compared to the system of uh, not medication? Because, of course, that, that was a very big issue. If the medication is increasing the risk of poor outcome, and when, when looking at five-year follow-up all these patients, we realized that, uh, that those people who had not used medication, their uh, rating of psychotic symptoms was much less compared to those who were on medication. Of course, this is a selective group, so see, this is not a kind of comparison or non-medication or medication, but at least it says that uh, not starting the medication and if we have an intensive way of taking care of the problem does not increase the risk of poor outcome. And uh, that's also visible while looking at the relapses. Those who were on medication had more relapses, especially during the first two years. There were no longer bigger, more, more, more uh, differences between the two and five years. Again, uh, not going into using the neuroleptic medication did not increase the risk of, uh, of relapse in this situation when we have very access to this active involvement of the, of the treatment system. And uh, then when we follow that uh, uh, at the employment rate, we realized that uh, in about in two and uh, five years, these had a very good rates compared to that we, we, we knew anywhere else. Two years, six, 16 percent. In five years, 19 percent were living on a, on a disability. And, uh, and uh, uh, in another study, we took out of these uh, those patients who only had a schizophrenia diagnosis and, uh, and uh, made a comparison into a treatment of, of usual and one research site that were a part of the Finnish national study and comparing the both the first and second group in Western Lapland. We can see a very big difference in many ways. First of all, hospitalizations. There was especially low hospitalization during the other part of the, of the uh, open dialogue studies compared to very high hospitalization rate in the treatment of usual group. And uh, there was a big difference compared to how, how much there were meetings with the family. In this system, there was a family involvement very systematically. Actually, only one family out of the 90 did not participate into the treatment, into the treatment meeting. So it was almost 100% participation of families in the, in the system. 
And uh, when we look at the uh, relapses, it's much higher compared to the treatment as usual. Employment status is very different com compared to the treatment as usual. And uh, how, how much there was left psychotic system. All those ratings, when compared to the treatment as usual, the differences were quite uh, significant. Of course, we can see that the groups are not so, the number of, of participants are not that big, which is unfortunately many times the case in doing this kind of research. When we, we did not find so many studies who have uh, done a longer term, longer term follow up, and we, we took another study that was made in Stockholm, uh, in, in Södermalm in Stockholm, in which there, there had followed uh, uh, five years' time people who came into the treatment 91 to 92, and uh, there were found some interesting uh, similarities and differences. Out of these non-affective psychotic patients, there were as much schizophrenia patient. The mean age of coming for the first time into treatment because of psychosis in Stockholm was higher. We can assume that the idea of not having a crisis intervention services may be related that people are more time psychotic when they come into the treatment. This is the knowledge that we know from many studies. People can be psychotic between one to two year, year before, before that. They were hospitalized, again in the same way as in the comparison to Finnish group, four times more. They were using medication almost every, uh, every case, and this is the dramatic difference again. In many st studies, first-time psychotic patients are living on a disability allowance, as it was in Stockholm, 62% compared to 19% in the, in, the, in the open dialogue studies. We really have been criticized of these results. One of the criticisms was shown in the, in the, in the first presentation by this Fries and uh, others who made a very, very let's say, non-scientific criticism about the research. Partly of that, and of course our own interest, we repeated with a replica of the same research to see if this is the case also 10 years after. And 10 years uh, after, after uh, 2003 and 2005, uh, we took a new cohort. And uh, what we found uh, was very, I, I will not go into details, you can, you can take a look at those, uh, this report in the, in, the, in the paper if you want, but only some general conclusions about this idea. Uh, first of all, we realized that the outcomes were about the same. 84% had returned to full employment. Uh, uh, but there were also very interesting differences. And, uh, and uh, first of all, we realized that uh, the mean age of those who came into the treatment was much younger. They were about 20 years of age. And it may be related with the fact that the duration of untreated period of time had declined to three weeks. It was in the middle of the 90s, three and a half months, when this open dialogue kind of idea has been in function a bit more than five years' time. But now when we came 15 years after, it really had declined. So that it's a very very good sign for uh, systematic community care planning. If you have systematic access to acute, uh, uh, acute uh, coming into the care in, uh, by acute teams and psychosis team, it seems that the, both the population learns to t make contact earlier so that people are no longer psy psychotic so long time, but perhaps also the professionals learn to make contact if they meet with a client who really need for help. And as a part of that very, very surprising phenomenon that we realized was that uh, there were no longer, not at all, as much schizophrenia patients. When in the middle of 18, the incidence of schizophrenia was uh, 33 new schizophrenia patients per 100,000 inhabitants. So 2003, 2005, it was two or a bit more than two. So it really had declined into one-tenth as it used to be. And it's a very, very dramatic conclusion and different. And uh, 
And uh, so, at least when you think of this outcome, I, I suppose that many politicians or whoever would become interested that, uh, that uh, what about if the way that we organize our system is related with how do people suffer mental health problems? So it's a big question for life. Or other way around, what happens to our society when we, took, uh, when, when we learn to take care of polio, tuberculosis and so on? And now all of a sudden we can make a guess question that what about there would not be a schizophrenia? And now, now I'm not uh, discussing about the concept of schizophrenia, but the phenomenon of illness. What we can also conclude here is that, uh, that uh, doing this kind of naturalistic research also surprisingly seems to increase the external validity. What we know about these randomized trials that has been done in a laboratory way in which there is some program that is followed, there is a manual, for instance, some therapy for that is followed, and then there is an exact same procedure for the control group to control that there are no other elements affecting the treatment compared to the one that is studied, studies. 20% of the efficacy disappears when this is put into real practice. Actually, this is the same amount that is seen in the medication research. 20% so of the efficacy uh, disappears when it's put in the practice on, on, in, in, in real case. But what happened here? The outcomes are exactly the same 10 years after. And that is why it's so important to think what are the design and ways of doing research and what kind of research is doing more accurate uh, information about the, about the treatment. And uh, very last slide, or conclusions about it. First of all, for me it's very important to speak about this, that, uh, that uh, open dialogue is really developing an intervened process with research. And I'm even, I, I have an even, even more strong opinion about this. I think that we cannot develop new practices if we do not do research about it. And I, many of my good friends and colleagues in family therapy, in whether they do not think about at all research being that important that it is. Then the other point is that to do research in a naturalistic way in which we come with the research in the real practice and follow what happens there. And of course, we learn to take care of the problems that is caused by our own problems because now we have own information about the situation, how it is. And in the, that doing this way, the external validity of the, of the research can be higher compared to empiristic clinical trials. And uh, we can do, for instance, this uh, research in a way that Bob was referring, that we can follow the non-medication group from the very beginning without an idea that we first have to medicate all and then withdraw, which is very, very unfair comparison for, for the, of the medication on the whole. We, can, we do not need to define that the people are either medicated or non-medicated, but we really can follow the practice in which we select out of the clients who are in the, in the medication or, 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 or not. And then we can follow the same kind of idea if the practice is same a bit after. Of course, this is very important to realize that this is not a research explaining that the outcomes come out, for instance, exactly the dialogical practice that happens here. That is not the idea here, but this is a description. We have an idea of the treatment and then we can follow what happens, what happens there. This research is going on. Now we have uh, actually this week submitted a paper in which the, we have first information of 20 years outcome of this first episode of psychotic patient. It's very interesting. And our main interest is to learn more that what is the idea of uh, psychotic experience in life of course, later on, we will also have exact information of the, of the outcomes and if, the, if they have stayed the same. We already know now that they are about the same, but we have not reached all the clients. But the main interest is really to look what is this uh, uh, psychotic experience meaning in, uh, in a very long term in, 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 
human life. But, uh, well, that was what I thought to share with you tonight. So, thank you. So, thank you, Jaco Saikula. And as you have uh, learned from the program, we are going to have an interesting panel debate soon. And in order to get as much as possible out of it in a short time, we will have a, only a 10-minute break.
Det er den nærmeste containeren. As you can see, the people in the panel have uh, already found their places. So if the rest of you will find your places, we can proceed. And uh, if we can have some silence, then we can really go on again. <laughs> so please find your seats and let us proceed. Uh, first, I am happy to inform you that uh, we are observed in outer space. Our technical uh, helpers are informing us that there is lots of activity uh, since this is streamed. There are lots of people uh, watching and commenting and so on. So that's fine. So, and as we are about to start the panel debate, I would like to introduce Magnus Hald, who is a, a newcomer uh, on the scene here. Magnus Hald is a psychiatrist. He is in charge of a, a clinic in northern Norway. And we have learned, Magnus Hald, that you have already established a medicine-free the treatment alternative at your clinic. So first I will give the words to you to say a few things. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Uh, yes uh, as you said, I am responsible for uh, a psychiatric facility in northern Norway as a director of uh, psychiatry or mental health and drug abuse at the University Hospital of northern Norway. Uh, and uh, we are responsible for psychiatric uh, center services for Troms County and Ofoten, that's the area around Narvik, 
and also responsible for hospital services for Finnmark in addition to our primary catchment area. And we also have some responsibility for Nordland County, regional responsibility. And within this region, we have between two and 300 psychiatric beds for adults. And now we're developing six so-called drug-free beds. It seems that this is something that some people think is very dangerous uh, and very challenging. I think it is in very many ways. Uh, but I'm not sure if this really uh, poses a danger uh, to psychiatry, which is which uh, I would really have hoped that it could. So it, to me, it's a very big challenge to develop this drug-free unit, not outside of psychiatry, but as a part of psychiatry, and a, a, a thing that and a unit that relates to the rest of our service system. So I hope it will be possible for this unit to to be to to develop. Uh, treatment programs that reach as far beyond this unit because six patients that's a very small unit and it's very limited possibilities what you can do within this unit so it's very important for me to develop this as a natural part of the psychiatry or the mental health service system that we have uh, and it's not going to be something that we develop on the side of it uh, so I would just uh, uh, emphasize that <clears throat> uh, and, and as I said, the, the main goal for this unit is to develop uh, drug-free uh, treatment programs or courses of treatment for individu individuals. And, and, the, and the basic idea here is that it should be possible for patients to choose not to use neuroleptics. That's the basic idea. And this should be possible whether or not doctors and other professional means that that's the best idea. And so in many respects, it's very simple. And we should, of course, be able to achieve this without within the system that we have. And why haven't we? This is really something for our, that we should think about. Why haven't we been able to do that? Although now, when we're developing this, people come from all over and say, we already have this. Uh, but this is something that uh, Felix Aksjon really hasn't understood, and that this is always in place. And my experience is that this is not in place. And, uh, and the development of this unit, which was established in our hospital uh, 1st of January this year, I think this is the first unit of this of its kind within the psychiatric hospital or or a mental health hospital system that I found in the world, like Soteria House, these other uh, things that have been tried out, they've all, all been established outside of hospitals as some kind of alternative. We're, we're trying to establish this as a part of the ordinary system. So it has to connect very closely to the rest of the system. And, uh, and uh, it's... Um, uh, very challenging for me to, to try to figure out what is it to take the user perspective seriously, both when we try to develop an organization and when we try to give good treatment to people. What is this? Some people seem to think that when you talk about evidence-based practice, that there is some kind of premise giving to research, uh, the research knowledge, which, which is an important part of evidence-based practice. But evidence-based practice is also uh, experience and also the, the, the user's choice. And some people th seem to think that the us users should be able to choose between different things that the evidence-based evidence has brought forth. I'm not sure if that is user perspective. Uh, mental health seems to be very occupied with trying to redefine people's problems in medical terms although we don't have a medical diagnostic system. We just have a classification system. But we use the classification system as if it was a medical diagnosis system. This is very strange in many ways, and also creates some kind of uh, strange foundations for evidence-based knowledge. And we should be very aware of that our diagnostic system is a classification system. So we, when we treat people for 
schizophrenia with drugs, we don't really know what schizophrenia is. We just know how we classify different symptoms. And the drugs, they work on the body in different ways. And we should be very aware about how drugs work on the body. And I think it's, and, and I think that the establishment of this drug for unit in our place has really emphasized the, the debate about this, at least in where I work. I feel that, for instance, when, when, you, when you talk about what is uh, defensible or justifiable, because we should only give, you know, defensible treatment to people, like you talked about, it should be, we should give defensible or justifiable treatment. Um, for Schwarli behandling, and what is that? So we discuss when is it defensible not to give drugs? Well, then we also get into a discussion when is it defensible to give drugs? And then people giving drugs, they tell, they say that, well, we always inform people very well. So I guess that the respect informed the patient that was taking Leponex that this might cause uh, your bone marrow to stop producing blood cells, and you might die if you don't take your blood tests, and, and uh, be, are sure that you don't get an infection, and that this medication might uh, reduce the white matter of your brain, and this medication might get you into risk of getting heart disease. So I think it's very good that we inform patients very well about you know, all these <laughs> problems with drugs. And, that's, and I guess, <clears throat> and also when, and also, since I'm, I'm, the, I'm the leader of this hospital, I can see how drugs are being used. And I see that, for instance, we have base, I mean, much of what's called evidence for drug use is evidence for using a single drug in a rather low dose. But I see very many patients get several drugs in higher doses. And that's, I, I haven't seen the very good evidence for that, not with even within the framework that kind of recognizes a kind of evidence. <laughs> So I think this is, but these are debates and discussions that are really, really being enlightened by the development of a drug for unit. But still, we're very much in the starting, at the starting point of, of making this unit, and we really don't know what it will be like. And we will try to have, a, there's a person that will try to do some research uh, uh, about what we're doing, but it's very difficult because we really don't know like you said, we really don't know which patient will be there because we don't know who, want, who will apply to be there and we don't know uh, who it, it will be possible to accept and we don't know who it will be possible to make a good uh, cooperation around uh, for being there. And we don't, so we really don't know who will be there and as you also said, we don't really know what is the intervention because there will be different interventions. Most people think it's very important to have specific interventions, I'm not quite sure, but we're working on that. And we're trying to find out what will be good interventions for these people. And that also uh, emphasizes the question, but yeah, how, what kind of interventions can be justifiable within specialized healthcare, within a specialized healthcare system? Can we do like anything? Acupuncture, you mentioned, I mean, is that a good idea or is it not a good idea? And when is it a good idea? And for what is it a good idea? Some people think it's a good idea that it's more easy to, that you can use it to help people sleep. Well, then you might use it in a place like this if it can help people sleep, because sleeping is a good idea. But I don't know. Is it justifiable or is it not? Thank you. Thank you, Magnus Hald. Um, for the audience, I would like to say that uh, you will have the opportunity later to, to ask questions to, to the speakers. But first, we will uh, have a few minutes, or quite a few minutes actually, where first I invite uh, all the other speakers to, to say something for two or three minutes, commenting perhaps on what, uh, what the other speakers have said. Then we have a discussion here, and then later on you will have the opportunity to, to ask questions. So we will now proceed with, uh, I think we stick to the sequence that we had with, uh, so I, I um, invite Håkon Rian Ulan for the first comment. Thank you. Um, when you play soccer, it's said that you should aim for the ball, not for the person, because that's good practice. Uh, Dr. Esberg, you didn't aim for the ball, you aimed for the person all the time. You cherry picked statements made by people in Fellesaktion 
uh, you correct, characterized Whitaker as Trump, uh, and, and I don't think this is a good way to, to talk to people. It's, it's, it doesn't, you didn't come across as a good psychiatrist. I was also told that the WHO, we so are a group, we, are, we don't want psychiatry. We don't want psychiatrists. I'm the leader of WSO. I think we do want psychiatrists, but we want good psychiatrists. That is very important, and that's a big distinction. And what, but what you did, it didn't show you as a good psychiatrist, I'm sorry. It, it uh, showed you as a person who is not concerned with truth. Uh, there are so many falsehoods in what you said, it, it embarrassed me, and I feel I'm quite upset with your presentation. Yes. Uh, I would like to thank the, I think still, I would li li like to give you credit. It's quite courageous to, to sit here with this group and uh, to present your views. That takes a lot of balls. So that's pretty good. Thank you. So you're next. Ah, thank you. I think I should have more time left. <laughs> <laughs> turning down my micro microphone. <laughs> I think I should have more time than the other, therefore against one here. <laughs> so, but, but I had many comments to the previous lectures, but I think I start by commenting the last one. Uh, I, it was not me who characterized him as Donald Trump. It was James Coyne, a psychologist. <laughs> So just that said, but uh, do you said that uh, the f uh, f Felix uh, Bissell overcome needs psychiatrists, and Magnus Wall, I, I think, ne said they need psychiatrists and psychologists. But if the patients, which we don't know who is, shall receive every treatment they want, as I heard Magnus Hall now, and what's the ma main aim of the? The Felix action. Why do we need psychiatrists then? Why do, we, why do we need research? Why do we need psychologists? If they are going to just say, I want that. We have, a similar, we have several similar problems in the somatic. I don't know if you remember Askakok, mistletoe. That was a big problem at the 70s and start of the 80s. The patients wanted it. Should we do, uh, treat cancer patients for, with uh, mistletoe? I don't think so. But the patients wanted it. Hmm. I think Radium Hospital not should buy the mistletoe to the patient. I think we agree that there are no quite good evidence for, for uh, treatment, uh, psychiatric uh, wards without medications. I, I haven't seen any in this lecture. And what fascinates me still, and that's uh, the presentation to Robert Whittaker. What, what does the study say? They said that mostly, I could go deep into each of them. They said that patients with a lot of psychiatric symptoms receive medications. Yes, they do. And those who don't need them doesn't get them. That's mainly what he is saying. I wonder if Whittaker has received any critics or something at the WHO study. The, uh, the uh, I don't remember the other study. The, I see the Haro study and Ödegö study. Has there been any critics against that? I still wondering also about the Soteria project. I met Laura Mosher in uh, Stavanger in 2000 and I cooperated with him in my PhD. He was a nice person. And uh, is there something you don't mention when you are citing the Soteria project? I think. I remember we were presenting at the same workshop and he get his paper in schizophrenia bulletin, which you saw, showed. You show that. But what you did but what we didn't show was the editorial from Will Carpenter, who said, if you are going to publish that paper, I am going to write an editorial who analyzes this study in quite another way. Go home and read that. That's quite different from what 
äh, Mittag ist er. Äh, Christ, äh, he mentioned a Cochrane review from, uh, from 2011. That was from Christopher Bolas. He was a student with Lauren Mosher. And Lauren Mosher was at Kingsley Hall at Laying's Clinic, where he get his uh, anti-psychiatric uh, teaching. So I could uh, tell you about these studies, I can go in detail, but I also wonder how does these studies fit in with the studies I mentioned, that people who use antipsychotics have le has less mortality. If you start early with treatment, they get less symptoms over the years. This is still questions. Thank okay, you. thank you. <laughs> so, Robert Whitaker is next. Uh, okay, I, I need an hour. No. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, you know, one of the things that's so interesting uh, is that uh, every study that psychiatry doesn't like, they'll attack. There's always something wrong, okay? And they'll get someone to say, oh, there's this problem with the methodology or something like this. You saw who these researchers were, and you saw what they concluded, not me. These were top researchers. And in, so if you have some people then are picking at me or picking at the researchers, you have to read psychiatry is a guild that protects its interests. And what's its product? What became the product increasingly of psychiatry? It was prescribing drugs. So if you have studies that end up saying that the unmedicated people or the people who stop taking medication are doing worse over and over again, What are you going to do? And you don't have a single study you can point to where the medicated patients did better long term. Not one. Doesn't exist. So what are you going to do? You're going to kill the messenger. You're going to attack the people doing the research, that sort of thing. That becomes revealing on its own. I'll tell you two, uh, one quick study story, and then I'm going to go to his point about the studies he was mentioning. When, when Martin Harrow did his study and he first published it, and, or first got ready to announce his 2007 results, he went to his, to his peers at the psychiatry department at the university he was at, and you know what they told him? Don't publish this. It's bad for psychiatry. And he had a trouble getting it published where there was peer review by other psychiatrists. And one of the things that you see in his initial publication, he says this, And this was reported in, Mad in Anatomy of an Epidemic. He says, it's not that uh, the drugs made things worse. It's just a matter of that people with good prognosis were the ones who got off. And all we really found, therefore, was that there's a select group of people who can do okay without the medications. So I interviewed him about that. And you'll see in the book that's reported. And I said, but wait a minute. That's not what your data shows. I said, listen, you have the good prognosis patients who got off did better than the good prognosis patients who stayed on. The bad prognosis patients who got off did better than the bad prognosis who stayed on. And then I said, how about your data when we look at the milder disorders off, excuse me, milder disorders on did worse than schizophrenia off. And you know what Martin Harrell said? A light bulb went off and he went back to his data and he said, oh my God. There's a problem here. And now he even cites me as saying that he sees his data in a new light, and now he's questioning whether antipsychotics, in fact, make things worse. Okay, so my point is, why is it that every time there's a study that goes against psychiatry's interest, they just try to kill it? Rather than be open-minded and learn from it and try to get better care. Isn't that the goal? Now, in terms of the uh, Tilhonen study about mortality that he refers to, that supposedly these drugs that cause diabetes and heart conditions and all uh, lengthen lives, believe it or not, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, I was asked to be a reviewer of that study by Lancet. It's an 11-year outcome study. Initially, they had it in a way that if someone had been on medications for 20 years 
and was dying from, say, heart problems or obesity, and then got off two weeks before they died, that was attributed to being off medication. That's how they were grouping the deaths. So I said, Lancet, you've got to reject this, uh, because the question is about how about length of use and mortality rates for length of use. So go look at the study. Now, there is a group that supposedly never used drugs during 11 years, quite a number of patient years. It's from a Finnish registry, if we're talking about the same study. And that group that supposedly never used drugs, which is an older group, by the way, from the get-go, that becomes your baseline for saying, okay, here's the mortality rate over 11-year period for all patients, okay? And they say, look at the people on drugs, who basically are younger, by the way, um, had a lower mortality rate than that baseline. But you know, go look at that study. You know who had the lowest rate over the 11 years? The group that used drugs six months or less. But they didn't point that out. So in fact, what you see, if you look at the drugs with increasing use, you see increasing mortality rates. So the group in that that had the lowest mortality rate over 11 years was the group that was on for six months or less. And Finnish people said, as far as people not taking drugs, there's all sorts of problems with that registry, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, they did it. But that study doesn't even show what it's said to show. How about the increased risk of suicide? We saw something about if you're off meds, it's 10 times the risk. Did you hear that today? It's often cited. You know where that study comes from? It comes from people released from a hospital who stopped taking the drugs for th the first month. And you know, you're right. You come out of a hospital, you've been on meds, and you stop taking those drugs, you're at really high risk of suicide. That's true. But that's not a no-med state. That's people who've been hospitalized and put into despair, and often they don't like the drugs. And in fact, if you've been on the drugs and come off abruptly, you're in trouble. And a Danish study found that your risk of suicide after relieve, uh, uh, leaving a hospital is 44 times higher than it would be otherwise. That's not a fair comparison. My point is, so much of what we hear that derives societal care is this sort of data organized to, con to, to support a practice that benefits the guild. And one of the things that you're doing here tonight, okay? Oh, and by the way, the TIP study, I think you're talking about the TIP study, which is the early duration study. It's not a study that compares no medication to medication. What the study does is it looks at people who got into care really early, I think it's like after five weeks, got medicated, and then we follow those people. And then the other group got into care like after 16 weeks of untreated psychosis, and they get medicated at 16 weeks too. There's no unmedicated group that's being compared there. What you're comparing is the somehow early treatment with antipsychotics compared to treatment that is initiated a little later with antipsychotics. Does that confer some long-term benefit? There's some questions about whether it really does at 10 years. But my point is, if you want to have a real study here, compare early treatment with, with drug or with a type of care like is at, at Open Dialogue, which doesn't initially use it. That's a fair comparison. But you can't, you can't say that antipsychotics are effective when you don't even have an unmedicated group. Does that make sense? And really, finally, what, from my perspective, the open dialogue is a proof of principle of a, of a type of care where you don't immediately neuro, use neuroleptics with anybody and you let to start to sort out who can get off without being on the medication and then who can use them just a per short period of time and then who needs them long term. A selective use model that begins without initial use but a lot of care and you see these great outcomes that are now at, repeated at five years and 10 years. And I don't know if you noticed it with the, the comparison between the Swedish and the Finnish data. I forget exactly, but I think it was like 17% were regularly maintained on drugs with the open dialogue. And then in Sweden, it was like 87 or something like that. And the outcomes were so much better with this group. That's just a nut, that's like a proof of principle by doing things differently. I'm sorry, but that's Sorry, went I, too long. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So, Saikula, please. Yeah, of
course, there is a lot of things to comment, but, but one, uh, what I be very, many more and more concerned is the very poor validity of psychiatric research. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I first became known, when we, at the 90s, we were in this research, and that was a period of time in which we said that every psychotic patient should be medicated because it's a psychosis in a neurotoxic process that you have to stop it and uh, it increases relapses if you do not medicate. And, uh, and uh, we started very early for get very other type of outcomes and then I became interested that uh, what is the background, what is the evidence for this treatment? And then I started to look at the research and I was very surprised because I really didn't find any research about it. And then I realized that how these uh, medication trials are done in psychiatry, they are done in a way that, uh, as Bob said, that first everyone is on medication and then it stopped. And then you follow six to eight weeks about the decline of symptoms. And if there is a, a difference in the group means in advantage for those who have used medication, you made a conclusion that the medication is needed to prevent the psychosis. And this is very non-valid research. It tells n any, nothing about the long-term outcome of the medication, and there are some studies showing that the difference that is in, between the groups in six to eight weeks is no longer there when you follow the groups in one year, but in one year it, it really could be the difference. But all the treatment of excellence guidelines for schizophrenia, for instance, in Finland, they refer tens and hundreds of this kind of studies with group comparison. And the second point, what is group, group comparison? Group, you may have a kind of group comparison difference statistically, even if 70% of the population is under the same variation. So that those people who are having the drugs and those people who are not having the drugs, 70% of those could be on the same variation and only 30% could be outside of the variation. And you make the conclusion for use of medication based on this 30% variation that may be after six or eight weeks better compared to those who did not use of the medication. It's very, well, this is a very shortly said, but, but, but the main idea of these randomized studies, empiristic studies are based on this kind of evidence. And then we come into the catastrophe that has happened nowadays, that when you follow, you isolate the phenomenon, and then all of a sudden you don't, you exclude all the other information, and now you are, as happened in the, in the studies of Andreas and group, to realize that it is the medication that start to make change in the brain function and the, in, the, in, the, in the brain tissue. And it's very much background is that the validity of this research that is uh, behind the recommendations in psychiatry is very poor. And it's a very frightening, frightening thing because, uh, because it's more or less use of power based on this kind of conclusions that are made and based on a poor validity that are repeated and then put into, into practice. And that really worries me. And that's why I also have started lately to speak more and more that the research mainly should be done in the real practice because in the real practice you also have uh, information about the complexity of the phenomenon and of the ideas of, of treatment. That's my comment. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all. Um, in all fairness, I think, respect that you, you have a point. You are a bit alone in the panel, so I will give the word to you now. I, I, this is not working all the time, so I hope that they can hear me. I, I have a, actually a lot to say. I don't know where to start. But uh, uh, you have five let minutes, me, actually. I have five. Oh, uh, let me start by saying that if we could find a psychosocial intervention without medication, that it was effective, I would embrace it with all my heart. I have researched psychosocial intervention for 20 years. But when this came up, that we should not use medication, I was, wow, that could be very, very difficult. To uh, have psychotherapy with patients with three voices in their head, 
lots of negative symptoms. It's very difficult to get an alliance, a relationship, to work with the problems, etc., etc. It's it's very difficult. Ask Tony Morrison. He is the only one who has done a study about that. Uh, I, so so I, I have to state once more: we don't know anything about drug-free boards. We don't even know about side effects. You said that we should uh, say something about uh, Leponex and Clozapine and the side effects of that. Of course, they are terrible. But what are the side effects of drug-free boards? Can somebody say something about that? We know that there are pretty much more side effects in psychotherapy that we used to believe, but we know, never measure it. Measure it. That's a big draw. As I said in the uh, lecture, I, it would be much more on a higher correlation if we took the number of psychotherapy sessions instead of medication and compared that with disability pension. So that's another op option. But I have to admit, I think both the Morrison study is very interesting and the Van Drink study is quite interesting, but we have to be critical about it. We have to analyze everything. We do that every day at the university. We look at the data once more. We don't say, oh, no, we don't uh, trust, uh, trust uh, this because it got, got the other way around. In fact, I think all my colleagues, if they have found something very interesting, they will follow it for everything it was worth and work day and night. So uh, that's open to the, to the open dialogue and, and, uh, and uh, need adapted treatment. It started in 1960 and still there are no good studies. I sat and looked at the comparison between Stockholm and Nor Norge Lapland. What was the difference? What was the similarities? How did you diagnose them? Hmm. That's questions which are very interesting. I hope you believe in diagnosis at least. Bec they have many, many faults. I know that, but uh, that, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, a wandering study, I think, also is fascinating. They show that uh, by reducing and low doses up to seven years, they, uh, they get better functional uh, outcome. And that's quite interesting. Maybe you have uh, used too much... Uh, too much uh, antipsychotic in the follow-up. But one interesting finding is also there. 80% of those who should discontinue or stop in that group, 80% used medication. That's much more in the TIPS project, where 65% at 10 years used medication. And that's quite interesting. They used actually more of the patient used medication than in the TIPS study. So it's not like that, that everyone uh, sh should have medication. And we, ha we have now since uh, Kreppelin and that, that some of the patients could do, do fine without medication. That's a, that we know. But since we don't know who they are yet, we have to... Uh, we have to say uh, uh, advice to take for all of them. We, we don't know who is, will have the effect of it. And it's uh, another thing, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I can come back. <laughs> okay. Okay, so a few more comments from the panel before we open to the audience. Who wants to go first? You're quite concerned with, uh, with studies and solid evidence. Uh, could you tell me where in the brain does the psychosis sit? Uh, where is schizophrenia? And what are the exact mechanisms of antipsychotics that treat this thing uh, somewhere? And, and how do you, what objective test can you use? What blood work can you set up? What um, CAT scan, MRIs can you use to see, oh, there's, there's schizophrenia or psychosis? This has been quite interesting. Uh, we started out with drug-free boards. Now we have been, uh, been discussing um, paternalism. We have discussed diagnosis. We have discussed how uh, uh, paternalistic the psychiatry are, and even what schizophrenia are. I, I think we have. 
as I said in my lecture, we have 123,000 studies of schizophrenia. Will you comment on this question? Yes, I'm going to do that. Okay. And, and we start, we don't, we, don't, we don't know exactly, but we are starting. I don't know if you saw the, the studies from the Bergens milieu, where they start to, to entangle the mystery of hearing voices. It was quite interesting, and it's a lot of studies doing interesting things, and we're starting to get the pu big puzzle together. It's not on, that doesn't exist. We start, and we have a long way more to go. Okay, Sekula. For 60 years, you've been treating with antipsychotics, and you still are not what you're treating. That's very interesting to me. <laughs> This is, uh, I, di I didn't quite follow when you said that uh, are there just diagnoses in the open dialogue studies? Of course there are just diagnoses. What's, what's the reliability on that? It's tested mm -hmm. and it's reported in the papers if you read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's uh, very in interesting to be in this uh, kind of debate that there is no uh, evidence of open dialogue treatment and I don't know any other approach that has been as much research and studied as open dialogue not even in psychosis and it's 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 uh, it's uh, you try to avoid seeing things that are there available and perhaps it's very much a question that if you are thought as a researcher only look of this very narrow point of view of the research you try to exclude everything else even if that other other things would be much more valid for the for the for the idea of treatment, uh, science journals did not have any difficulties of uh, referring to open dialogue studies, but it seems that some professors in Oslo do not acknowledge that. So that is. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Now I would like to turn to our very patient audience and invite you to come forward with, um, with a few questions or comments. And as we have only about half an hour left, there's no time for extensive speeches, so you have to restrict yourself to short comments or questions. And Ranvai will uh, hand over the microphone. Do I? Let's see where the first hand comes up. Um, what, uh, uh, as you said, Rus Rusl uh, Berg, uh, there, uh, you, you claim there is no evidence for medication-free uh, uh, wards. But now, when a place in Tromsø is open, in Sita at the Hurdalsjön Recovery Center tries that, several of the places are open in the official there you can get an excellent basis of research when the, when the words are going on. There you get your research material and then you can uh, compare with, with ordinary units. Thank you. Hello, I started my practice in uh, is I, uh, yeah, working in the psychiatry at uh, Kastanjebakken and I'm very sad that the Haugsjärd now has left. Oh, this way. Because, because I don't think the result from Kastanjebakken where they could do whatever they like I was in a meet when we had meetings there, we had to face the door because it was dangerous to turn the back to the door because the patient with or without the clothes were coming, running in and out. And I think what I found out from Kastanjebakken was that it was no use continuing that line. And I ended being uh, in the TIPS project and saw what we did there especially with the family therapy who was psychoeducative 
and how happy the parents were and how happy everybody was. And when I think back, when we had <laughs> Haley, you probably have heard of Haley, who said he cured people from psycho psychosis with his way of therapy. Of course, we weren't Haley, but we tried it, and I can stay awake all night thinking of what we made those people uh, suffer, whatever I should say. So I'm so for Resberg, <laughs> and I think it's so brave of you to be here and say what you say. And of course, uh, Whittaker has some fantastic uh, results from all his uh, studies, but he didn't say anything uh, much about what these studies really were. It was just a lot of uh, uh, numbers. Sorry. No, not really. <laughs> that was a great comment. So you're, you're not alone. Okay. Anyone else? Rena Stensre, I'm an occupational therapist. I wonder what, how do you define psychosocial intervention? Comment on that. Should I answer? Both of you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for me, I don't have any other definition by, by only by referring both, both words psycho and social. So it's a kind of intervention for help of our client that uh, is based on uh, psychological meetings and of course focusing on the social elements of the of the lives that's what I, I i really think that the open dialogue you could call for instance as a kind of psychosocial intervention in that respect Jesper, you want to make yeah, a call? No, I, I agree this uh, psychosocial intervention interventions without uh, medication who try to help the patients with the difficult thoughts feelings uh, functioning, not at least, and uh, that's what, milieu therapy, early intervention, so, some sort of things. <laughs> we saw that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my name is Elke Landeweer, and I'm working here in Oslo as a researcher, but I'm original from the Netherlands. And uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we have a slightly different history that uh, involuntary medication is, uh, is uh, by history thought of as, uh, as more severe than seclusion. So we had a lot of debate on, uh, on how to deal with aggression in uh, mental hospitals. But I understand now that here in Norway it is slightly different and uh, I get the impression that almost all patients who are admitted in the hospital with uh, severe mental illness are getting medication. So what do you do with patients who are psycho psychotic and don't want to take medication? Are they automatically receiving in uh, involuntary medication, coerced medication, or do you send them home? Okay, great question from the Netherlands. <laughs> yep. How to answer that? Uh, if I understood it right, you said, how do we treat patients? with psychotic symptoms who don't want medication. We try the very best we can to, with the best of therapy, include the family, good milieu therapy, occupational functioning, etc., etc., etc. But we, well, what was that to laugh about? Well, of course we do. And, and in, I, I can just refer to the TIPS project. Uh, at start, 80, eight, over 80% took uh, medication uh, uh, with, with no, uh, uh, out of free will. 
So, uh, and what was interesting, if you looked at the data, uh, those who were uh, on uh, different uh, laws, admitted unfavorably, uh, they were worse when they were admitted than those who were not. But at two years, there were no difference. They had the same quality of life, they had the same uh, symptoms, etc., etc. Minus Hall, yes? Uh, I would say that most of the patients that are coerced when they go into psychiatry, they will be uh, treated with coercion if they don't take the medication voluntarily. But those that are voluntarily in the hospital, they will be uh, not, they will be sent home unless they behave in a way where they thought, where, where the doctor thinks that they should be coerced. Then they will be coerced and forcefully treated. And then there's also the question about when do you, uh, the difference between coercion and, and taking things voluntarily. And that's been a, an important thing for the Fellesaktion and for the drug free treatment place is that you, we should not only, our people should not only be able not to choose drugs, but they should also be not be talked into it. Uh, so because that seems to be a, an important part of psychiatric practice to talk people into taking medication because medication is often experienced as so difficult to take. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I would also like to, com to have a comment with uh, something you said earlier, that there are many patients that, that uh, psychiatry don't think that need medication, but the problem is that we don't know who they are. And since we don't know who they are, we could choose not to give anyone medication or to give all medication, and then psychiatry chooses to give everyone medication. And that's, that's different. And I think, I also think that's, that's very different from what you said, that those that don't need them don't get them. You said that earlier. Those that don't need them don't get them, referring to neuroleptics, because uh, we give neuroleptics also to people that we see that they do not get better with their psychotic symptoms, but they still keep getting neuroleptics. So when I look into the patients in our clinic, I can see that people that are chronically psychotic, they still get neuroleptics. So how come they get neuroleptics if they don't get better? And, and, uh, and, so, and there's also a question in this, they don't get it if they don't need it. Who decides who needs it? Uh, and that's, a, that's an important question. And, and, uh, and I think that's a difficult question because sometimes it's, it, I mean, it's, sometimes it's very difficult to say uh, who should be able to express a view on this. I mean, when should the doctor be able, when should the patient be able, generally the patient should be able to decide this for him or herself. But that's, and, and I hope that developing a drug-free program will make that more possible because I think that we experience now in the psychiatric service system that if someone comes in with a lot of psychotic symptoms, that we have to try drugs in a way, and we have to help the, help the person try drugs. Uh, and uh, I think we, we, have to, we have to debate them about who should be able to decide. I mean, who, who should make this decision? That's, uh, I think it's a difficult, difficult question. And I would just add a last thing, and that is, I don't mean that, you know, like anything goes, but I mean that these are problematic issues. And I think it's very good that a drug-free program kind of highlights these issues and makes all these discussions, because I think that's important by itself. Okay. So there, there are two panel members who will make just short uh, comments, and then we'll go back to the audience. Short comments. I think it's interesting, when you come to a psychiatric ward and you're very upset and very scared, and uh, you consider perhaps you're psychotic, and uh, you ask perhaps you should try some antipsychotic drugs. And you, then if you say, I want to hear about it, and you are, you are not considered, you are not really competent when you come to a psychiatric ward because it's so difficult to get into them. But still, you, you are capable of saying yes, even when you're given a list of all the side effects, and they are long, and they are severe. But if you, if you say, no, I don't want it, and you consider it incompetent, then yeah, you can take it anyway. It's, there's something so, so, something so degrading in the system of, of drugs that it's, it's rather scary, because you sit there and become God over people's lives. You say, you should take this medicine, 
this is best for you. I don't care what you think. I, I know what's right. I think that I wish for psychiatrists to consider their, their power a bit more. So, Saikula. Yeah, of course I understand because we are here for discussing the drug-free services, so that this is a issue, main issue to discuss about. But, but, but uh, in, in my mind it's also very important to have in mind that uh, to look at the medication issue as a part of the entity of the treatment and uh, what concern, for instance, open dialogue. It never has been a kind of non-medication idea. That's not at all the main point. And, 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 and for me, the main point is not to think that you have to stop medication and then doing something else, but it's the opposite. You need to have a, let's say, a kind of psychosocial, very active psychosocial way of helping with people in which medication can be a part. And what our results show that if you have that, then you have access to decline the role of, of, of medication. There is a risk that, uh, that this medication issue becomes a kind of too big that we only discuss about it, if it is medicated or not medicated, and that's the problem. And that's, of course, how the research are done, either medicated or non-medicated, and that's, again, very non-valid idea of the treatment on the whole. Okay. Jasper, you want to comment? Yeah. A lot of questions. I want to say another thing. I wonder if the 21 million Norwegian kroner you are using on the six drug-free wards in northern Norway, could we use those differently? Could we have ACT team, which we know works? Could we have early intervention? Could we start it with family work? You could do a lot. Inpatient settings is the most expensive treatment we get. We, we, uh, they gives. are doing all that in Tromsø, I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, they are? Yeah. So, the, so you are so exclusive that you have all the money already. <laughs> then I rest my case if you have all this. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, med med treatment with medication could be better. Uh, there's, I think the psychiatrist should reduce uh, qu uh, quicker. I should, they should be more aware of when they should give uh, antipsychotics, if, if they are effective, uh, evaluate that continuously. And there's a lot of things. Maybe we could use those 21 million other places in Norway to improve the treatment. Okay. Uh, Ranvei, do you know who's next? Okay. Hi, <coughs> Björn Lydersen from uh, Norsk Sykepleverbund, Norwegian Nurses Organization. Um, I think it's for a long time it's been um, uh, health services on the terms and conditions of us professionals. It's uh, time for a change, that the health services should be on the terms and conditions of the patients. And um, I think uh, psychiatry has been a, an area where we have been the first to um, doubt that patients know their own best. Uh, and I think it should be a, a stop for that now. I think we should have a dialogue with the patients to ask them what is the best for you. Um, it's not automatically that when you have a mental health problem then you don't are capable of knowing what's best for you in any, in any, any terms. Uh, and I think it's uh, to, too bad as well that um, that's the kind of admittance on, in a hospital where you have an effective gatekeeper saying that we can offer you that kind of treatment, that kind of treatment, and that kind of treatment in addition to medication. First medication and then you can have the rest. Um, uh, it's uh, right that we don't have very much research uh, on the effect of um, medication-free units, but we know also that the uh, effect, uh, the, the, the quality of the research on uh, the use of, of medication is very doubtful. Uh, the same medication would uh, probably not be accepted as uh, for use in in uh, if, if the effect, efficacy 
was uh, the same on, on uh, different somatic uh, illnesses. Hmm. What? Uh, so, so, so um, when um, uh, I, I, I hear here then that uh, it's uh, the way of debating is to laugh at people. I, I, I don't think that's uh, the right thing to do. I just wanted to, to say that the Norwegian Nurses Organization, uh, we, want, uh, we have a political platform on mental health amongst other political platforms. And one of them is, we know that many people have, say they have good effects on medica medication, and that's fine, that's very good. Uh, but our point is that we want people to have a choice, a real choice. So we want that people should have a, a, a possibility, a real possibility, to choose a medication-free alternative if they want to. So, uh, and uh, my question would then be to Respa, the laugher. Uh, is... Uh, uh, when, when we speak of the health services on the patient's uh, terms and conditions, patientens helsevesen, uh, uh, what is your definition of that? Uh, would that be to what kind of uh, accept would you give to a patient's wish to what kind of treatment he wanted to? I could say to the Dutch lady here, uh, my impression would be if you come to a ward, we do whatever we can to persuade you to take medication if you say you don't want to. Uh, would you do that or do I mistake you? Thank you. I need to answer that. I, I, did, I did not laugh. I said, what? If, if you think that the antipsychotic medication now is so bad that it di wouldn't be approved, if, they were, if I heard what you say correctly, Today, that's a quite a misunderstanding. I think they would at once get approved for showing improvement in symptoms. What I mean about the patient services, I think I said that uh, cl quite clearly in my lecture. I think uh, the, the patient should choose whatever they want, what they, what they think is best for them. But I also think we should not have uh, an... Uh, an evaluated treatment in the official health services. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, before I give uh, the word to Einar Flynn, stand up Einar. Um, I think we should give Einar a big applause but because he has made this conference and got all these people to come here. There's, there are many more than me that have made this uh, conference possible, but thank you. I have a question for uh, Rosberg. Um, do you consider your talk here today as evidence-based? Uh, and I ask this question because listening to your talk, I got quite confused about what you mean by evidence. <laughs> that was yeah. quite a thought. Just, just before you yeah. reply, I think we have four more people on the list, so we will let them come forward first, and then you and the other in the panel may have a final uh, comment. Yeah, uh, it, 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 I am Per Oren from, from Aurora. We, we want to try to stop... Uh, the, the way the, way the, the, the psychiatrists make decisions about medicine practice by, by uh, uh, um, starting a, a, a court trial against the state and look at how the, the sh journals of the patients are, are filled out by, by, the, by the, the, the doctors. We think we hear, we hear that there are so many lacking things in the, the, the journals that our lawyer will, will try to, to address this problem. And, and hopefully, 
if we, if we, if we, if we, if we get enough show notes from, from, from you, uh, you, you, you may, you may, add, um, you may approach us with your case, and, and if you, the journal has very lacking, yeah, that is, it is not made according to a modern concept of, of, of health practice that we should have in, in our country. If you, if you think, think your, your journals and your, your decisions about medicine have been wrong, come to us and with your, your case, and we will look at it. If, and if it, if it is good enough, we, we can use it against the okay, state. Okay, I think you made your point. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yes, I will not tell my name because of confidentiality. Uh, you are so obsessed with not bringing in the family. I'm the father of a, um, a daughter who finished her education, m hit the wall. On the second um, consultation with a psychiatrist, she got neuroleptics. And two psychiatrists have now said this was terribly wrong. But she has lost the life from 28 to 41 with a full degree from NTNU, ready for giving her life to her profession. And I'm shocked about your attitude to your profession. Your, uh, I mean, it's, it, okay, the human you. brain, you need to the now. human brain is the most complex thing we have. And if you had noticed what Nancy Andreasen, who is the biggest researcher of all probably, she said to New York Times that these, uh, this medication is harmful. It reduces the gray area of the brain. And, and it should, if it should be stopped, it should be reduced to a minimum. Okay. And that was 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. I need to stop it. So well, we have two more from the audience. We don't have time for more, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was reflecting on um, wishing a little bit um, um, curiosity about um, uh, getting systematic feedback from the patients. I think that there are some trenches here and I'm a little bit saddened to, to that polarized debate. So I think that systematically asking the patient, even if they have some persisting psychotic ideas, um, on, on um, how uh, may we help you? Has this treatment been useful? And to, to make a, a more um, coherent evaluation of uh, functional results and to, to monitor this more systematically throughout the mental health services. Thank you. So, last comment or question from the audience. Uh, I'm Peter, student in dentistry. I have a question for uh, Rosberg. Um, you seem like you, Lan, said, uh, quite concerned with studies and uh, evidence. Throughout Whitaker's uh, lecture on um, on the basis for antipsychotics for uh, schizophrenia, it's, it's a very lacking scientific evidence. Do you acknowledge that or do you still deny it? Okay, thank you. So now we have a few minutes left, so uh, the panel members now have a chance for a last remark. Who wants to go first? Whitaker? 
Listen, uh, you know, these debates do get contentious. But listen, it's a, it, w what happens, I think, first of all, to, you're to be congratulated here in Norway. You're taking this on. It raises all sorts of questions. Uh, you're the first country that has taken this on in this way, so congratulations. And it's not easy, but congratulations. <laughs> and just from the outside is this. You know, society gets driven by narratives. And so we've had this particular narrative for a long time in psychiatry, which put drugs at the center of it in the sense that uh, they were necessarily helpful. And that's the narrative that's been out there and that it was an evidence-based practice. And now what you really have is a counter-narrative that is out there that is challenging that conventional narrative. And when narratives clash, it's not easy. But things do change, paradigms shift. And one of the things is maybe evidence, when closely examined, can help foster that paradigm shift. And the biggest thing here is this, and, society, and I travel all over. Societies are unhappy with the type of care they have now. It's not lessening the burden of mental illness in society after society. So what you're doing here is part of what I think is a larger effort to rethink how we consider mental problems, how we deal with them as a society. We've had one paradigm. It really hasn't worked. We need a new paradigm. And God bless you all because you're here tonight in part of the struggle to see what should the future be like. And that's a really brave thing to do. Thank you. Hula? Yes. Um, uh, Hudorsche and Recovery Center was mentioned. You have 500 people waiting in line to get in there. They can't. I think that's a, quite a strong point that there is a need for medication-free alternatives. And if you go to a, a psychiatric ward and you meet some of the people that sit in a, a closed ward especially, uh, who sit in a chair drooling, shaking, uh, you look into their eyes and you see just about nothing, then you also understand that medication is not the solution at least not the way that it's used. It might help if you're totally running around and you're very scared and you feel very uh, afraid. Of course, perhaps you need to, to cool down, you need to get some sleep. But if you continue years after years, you give 10, 20 different medications, the same time to the same person. And then at the same time, you hear psychiatrists talking about quality of life. That really upsets me. Because that is not quality of life, sitting in a chair drooling and shaking and not being able to speak, to feel, or anything. That is not quality of life. And, yeah, I would like to see the psychiatrists who dare to take the same drugs that some people are given in our Norwegian wards. Please, try. Thank you. Uh, of course, there's uh, plenty of things in my mind, but perhaps the things that comes more and more up in my mind is uh, I, 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 I move in many countries. I've been in Norway since uh, coming to Norway since 25 years ago, quite regularly. And what really has struck me and impressed me is the strong uh, idea in your society to have it. This was perhaps the first country in the world in which I really realized that the voice of the people who have their own lived experience within psychiatry is very strongly present in the society. And I, I, I suppose that this is also the background of this new idea of having this drug-free idea. And that, that's a very impressive. I'm very impressed. And that's why I also like this debate. Of course, of course, I start to think that it's not only a science, it's very much of ethical values of human life that we discuss all the, all the time, so that I'm, 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 I'm a part a scientist, but I'm part very moved of this discussion. Yeah. Yes, I would, I would agree very much with you. The ethical questions around this is, are very central. And uh, I would also say that uh, we are trying to develop some research that can follow the development of this of the unit that we have and uh, but we still don't know uh, if we'll get money for that uh, we hope we will and there's uh, there's a big interest in trying to develop some research and on a national level there will also be some 
uh, research by Brukers per Bruker. What's that? What's you, user Ask User Project, uh, which will try to look into the, the how the people that uses this kind of uh, unit, how they uh, uh, how they, how they feel about it, and uh, and I do hope that we will be able to develop this drug-free unit in such a way that the individual individual pa patient will feel that he or she can you know get get on in life in a more meaningful way. I think that's our basic goal, uh, and I also hope that we will be able to develop it in such a way that the field will see that there is some possibilities here. Maybe there's something there, and look into what that can be. So that's the basic goal. I think we all have the same goal to make the best treatment for patients with psychosis. I, I doubt that, but we disagree on how to do it, I think. What, what I think was uh, missing here is uh, uh, you, you have misunderstood me if you don't think I mean family work and psychotherapy is important. I worked 20 years to try to increase the use of family work. So that's m extremely important. No, that's, uh, that's, I've written about 15 papers about it. So, uh, so that's a, a little, no. Uh, and I think the systematic feedback is very important. We ha m m have to be much better to, does this treatment work? Or if it doesn't, we have to change. We have to do something else. And that's very important. And I think that's one of the biggest issues we have to be better at. But what I want to tell is when I, uh, when I raised this debate in, uh, in June, I was so uh, eager and I was so occupied with psychosocial intervention. I have been researching that for so many years. And that's where my heart is. And then I start reading about medication. I was in many ways forced to read about medication. And I think we have a lot just in research and methodology and uh, evaluate the negative effects, et cetera, et cetera, about how they have used it in the medication research. Because what I have read is not what is coming up here. This is quite different. I have read uh, evaluation from the uh, best professors and scientists in the world of what they think, where they evaluate everything, pros et con, is it positive, is it not positive, is the side effects uh, worse than the uh, effect. A, a lot of those papers, and I think uh, I am in many ways changing my thoughts about that, because there are so much good studies. and. And I think we have to recognize that, uh, I, yes. And to, uh, yeah, I think I said thank you for that. Um, thank you. So a great thank you to our speakers and for the panel discussion. And thank you to the audience. Good night. <laughs>